Council, March, if I got the right date, March 13th, uh, Wednesday. Um, while the mayor is absent, I'm the vice mayor, so I'll be conducting the meeting. And I want to uh, welcome everyone again and our council members. And we will start with a Pledge of Allegiance. And I am going to ask, actually, Megan Ebert, our council member, to lead us, please. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you, everyone. And Madam Clerk, we're looking for a roll call, please. Thank you. Good morning, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> roll call for Wednesday, March 13th. Councilmember Breckis, absent at this time. Dewar? Here. Martinez? Here. Ebert? Here. Taylor? Here. Reese? Here. Sheevy? Absent at this time. Madam Vice Mayor, you do have a quorum of the Reno City Council. All right. Thanks so much. And our next item on the agenda is, in fact, public comment. So, Madam Clerk, back to you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Vice Mayor, our first item today is public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering through the following link, which can be found on reno.gov forward slash meetings, https colon forward slash forward slash l-i-n-k-s period r-e-n-o period g-o-v forward slash capital C O U N C I L zero three hyphen one three. It should be noted for those in the audience that comments are to be addressed to the mayor and council as a whole. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the council's agenda. Council may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you're called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. For those participating in chambers in accordance with council rules 6.3.11, while in this room, please be respectful. Disrupt disruptive behavior from audience members like clapping, yelling, whistling, etc., which impede the meeting may result in a warning issued by the presiding officer. If this behavior continues, you may be removed from chambers. If you're an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Our first public commenter, is Mark Markell, followed by Terry Brooks, followed by Bill Miller. All right. Welcome, Mark. Hello. Very well. Okay. So I can talk in this thing. Is it on? Uh, yeah. Good morning. My name is Mark Markell. I'm a concerned Reno resident. How are you, council members, uh, city manager, and vice mayor? Uh, I was involved. I'm here today to show people and warn people about getting in a car with a drunk driver. Uh, back in 89, I was a passenger in the car, and we rolled eight times, and I was ejected and landed on my head. I'm, 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 I'm not all there, so I, I, I'm kind of a goofball. But anyways, I, I just want to... I don't know. I I know I was. What, what was I? What, what, I we rolled eight times. I got ejected and it landed on my head. Put me in a coma for a month, and in the hospital for five and a half months more. Um. I just want to warn people and show people what happens when you ride drunk drivers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Terry Brooks, followed by Bill Miller, followed by Sharon Chamberlain. Good morning. It's me, Terry Brooks, again. 
And today I feel the responsibilities to address discrimination against those with mental disabilities. There are a lot of different kinds of mental disabilities, some of which will make it difficult for certain capabilities. But the impairment of some capabilities can actually increase the focus on some other capabilities. If someone finds it difficult to focus on one thing, it might direct their attention to focus more on another thing. If someone finds it difficult to focus on what they hear, it may be easier for them to focus on what they see. Or if someone finds it difficult to focus on quality, their attention might be focused more on quality. Everyone experiences a different possession of a variety of all kinds of obsession. Some people are obsessed with what their mind occupies, of which it is easier for them to memorize. So when such a thing at the time applies, it is easier for them to recognize. And in some cases, that really simplifies a situation where such people supervise. Some people are obsessed with things being alphabetized, which can wind up making an inventory more organized. Some people are obsessed with things that rhyme. That could or could not be a waste of time. We are all different in our own mental ways, so we are all valuable in a variety of ways. I would like to thank you all for putting up with me today and for listening to me speak in my own obsessive way. Thank you. All right, thank you, Terry. Bill Miller, followed by Sharon Chamberlain. Good morning. Good morning. Vice Mayor Durer, council members, staff and fellow citizens, I'm Bill Miller, climateer and resident, here once again representing the climate of our fair city. First up, as always, is to acknowledge this council for taking climate change seriously and to thank you for the many actions you have taken. Second, to encourage you to do what you are likely to do when item D2 comes up for discussion, which will be to accept the recommendations of the RTC for their 2025 plan. This is all good, but as you are aware, nowhere near enough. The global heating crisis is here now, sitting right on top of us, right here in Reno. We are experiencing a weirdly warm win winter, record setting, warmer than last winter, which was warmer than the one before. So warm, in fact, that I have left the hose attached to my backyard faucet and all winter and have been able to refill my bird bath almost every morning. That should be terrifying. Yet, we mostly go about our lives worrying about other things. Intellectually, we are caught in a paradox of our own making. With the internet, we have access to virtually all the facts that have been accumulated over millennia. Yet millions are choosing instead to believe absurd, fact-free conspiracy theories, essentially choosing superstition over reality. One recent superstition that lingers in spite of mountains of evidence to the contrary is that all climate science is fraudulent. Even our own governor has withdrawn Nevada from the Paris Climate Accords, citing no actual evidence. In truth, climate, care, climate doesn't care what we believe any more than gravity. If I jump off the top of this building, I can believe I'm flying, but will crash into the sidewalk and die a very messy death. Same if I am pushed, and although my experience of falling will be different, the end will still be the same. But if instead, by using my rational brain, I walk away from the edge and slowly come down the stairs, I will survive and be able to prosper. Absolutely. But how to get billions of, have I run out of, oh. How to no, get billions fine. of people to do that simultaneously is the trick. Climateers is offering an idea. Make it uplifting, make it fun. We are hosting a confab in April, you'll be hearing more about in, um, f uh, to bring the climate concerned community together and shift into a higher level of engagement. Meanwhile, council, keep up the good work. Our lives depend on it. 
Thanks for your time. All right. Thank you, Bill. And I'm just going to add a parenthetical comment today, ironically. I posted um, something about the topic you're speaking about, and it's called Spring is Here Very Early. That's not good. And I just wanted to read a uh, two paragraph, well, two sentences out of this. It said, while it's, uh, it's jarring emotionally this early spring, deeply consequential for the environment and economically taxing for places that rely on cold weather activities such as skiing and snowboarding, such as our area. And I just said, let's try to make the best of it. Pansies, here we come. But I did want to make a comment. Um, at the beginning of their article, they said, according to uh, NOAA, the 2023-2024 winter is the warmest one we've seen in 130 years that they've been tracking. And per the University of Arizona National Phenology Network, signs of spring in certain parts of the country, like the budding of the first lilacs and honeysuckle leaves, have emerged the earliest they have since the organization began keeping records in 1981. So I think you're right on point, and I'm looking forward to hearing about your conference. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk. Sharon Chamberlain. Good morning, Vice Mayor and uh, esteemed council members. Nice to see you here, Sharon. Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, I am Sharon Chamberlain, the CEO of Northern Nevada Hopes, and it's my pleasure to present today to share exciting news about the forthcoming opening of our new clinic, the Jerry Smith Community Wellness Center. Situated on East 4th Street, adjacent to the Washoe County Operated Cares Campus and across from Hopes Bridge Housing Community, Hope Springs, the center is set, set to welcome patients in just a few weeks. The clinic will serve 12,000 patients annually in addition to the 14,000 already receiving care from HOPES. With the inauguration of this clinic, HOPES will broaden its range of services, including primary medical care, behavioral health care, substance use treatment, a same-day clinic, and additional wraparound services. This expansion reflects our enduring commitment to addressing our community's most pressing challenges, a commitment that aligns with your advocacy and dedication to improving access to mental health, addiction, medicine, and primary care for the under-resourced. Our dedicated team at HOPES, intimately acquainted with this population, understands the essential care and services needed to empower patients toward a better life through improved health. This involves extending dignity and kindness to every patient, addressing their fundamental human needs, such as access to affordable medications, medical care, case management, and housing. Patients at the Jerry Smith Community Wellness Center will have access to a comprehensive array of behavioral health care services, including individual, couple, and family therapy, psychiatry, trauma counseling, support groups, stress management, and our intensive outpatient program. This program offers a bridge between traditional outpatient therapy and inpatient hospitalization, aiding patients in addressing emotional issues, substance use, or trauma to resume their daily lives. Amidst the rising challenges of substance use disorders and overdose deaths in our community and nation, HOPES has provided support through medication-assisted treatment, or MAT, for close to a decade. Our expansion of this gold standard of care offers a personalized approach and treatment plan, equipping individuals and families with the tools needed for a long-term recovery and success. To further our commitment to the vulnerable members of the community, the Jerry Smith Community Wellness Center will house a same-day clinic. This will support individuals accessing resources at the CARES campus, reducing unnecessary emergency support <coughs> services and saving valuable resources. Reflecting on my role as CEO, I often express my gratitude for the privilege of working with the exceptional HOPE staff. Their impact on the lives of our patients is truly remarkable, creating a warm and inviting atmosphere while delivering high quality and expert care. As our community uh, expands, collaborative efforts are crucial in addressing challenges. HOPES will continue to partner with private and government entities seeking funding to ensure our services are accessible to all in need. Together, we can enhance the health of our community, caring for one patient at a time. Thank you for your attention and support. And, and before you leave, Sharon, I just have to share, um, you know, I had a chance recently this past month to tour both the Tiny Homes Project, the Hope Springs, as well as the new medical facility, and it was truly phenomenal. I, uh, my tour guides were Mandy Larson and Amy Satoff over at 
Hope Springs, and then your project manager, Pam Silar, who also worked with us on planting trees at um, Mamie Tolls Elementary School, oh, which was a phenomenal yes. project in and of itself. But I just wanted to say what I particularly noted was the thing you first mentioned about the mental health, that you have an entire uh, array of areas to interview patients, yes. keep give patients dignity and privacy. Um, I, I understood about soundproof walls and all that. And also the amount of um, doctors that you're hiring, doctors and medical professionals of all stripes. And it sounds like a number from out of the area that you're you're bringing in yes is that that's a true yes that is accurate yes it, it was really remarkable and I, I do hope that the rest of the council if they haven't already um, have a chance to tour both but most you know this new medical facility of yours is uh, truly remarkable yes so. we would welcome that thank you all right well thank you thank you Madam Vice Mayor, with that, we have no additional public comment. We okay. do not have any hands raised in Zoom. And for the record, we did receive 20 comments which were general in nature or not directly associated with an, ag an agenda item prior to 4 p.m. yesterday, March 12th. Okay. These comments were voicemail and or written correspondence received via our reno.gov online public comment form or by email to our office. Copies of these have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are available to the public on reno.gov forward slash meetings. One in favor, three in opposition, and 16 letters of concern. And with that, we're closing out item A3, public comment, moving into item A4, approval of the agenda. All right, very good. Um, and then do we want to pull items at this time, or do you want to? Uh... Well, I just want to say that the yeah. applicant for C1, C2, and C3 is going to ask for continuance um, without a certain date. And so it will have to be re-noticed. It is the advice from the city attorney's office at this juncture that we open the public hearing, take public comment, and then Consider grant it. the continuance. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, with that, Meg, Thank you. Approve. Thank you. Uh, could I get a second, please? Second. All right, motion from Mr. Reese, second from Mr. Martinez to approve the agenda. Any comments? All right, see none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Um, we're now going to move on to uh, approval of the minutes. Move to approve the February 14 minutes. Second. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um, again, a motion by Mr. Reese, second by Mr. Martinez to approve the minutes. Are there any amendations or concerns about the minutes? All right. Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. We're on to the consent agenda, and at this point, I want to ask anyone if they'd like to pull any item off the consent agenda, and I'm going to start with you, Mr. Martinez. Nothing for me, Madam Nothing Vice Mayor. Nothing for you? Thank you. Okay. Nothing for me. Thank you. All right. Nothing, Madam Vice Mayor. All right, and Ms. Nothing Hebert. for me. All right, I had one item, let me just see, and that was item... Um, B6, and it's just because it's over a million bucks, and I always want our people to know what we're spending our money on. Um, so with that, Move may I get a... approve the remaining items. Thank you. Second. All right. We have a motion to approve the items except for B6, and a second from Mr. Martinez. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we're going to go to item B6 now. And can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I, I do have a, okay, there it is. Oh, there you yeah. go. My name is Jonathan Smith. Uh, good morning, Vice Mayor and yeah. House members. My name is Jonathan Smith, Senior Civil Engineer with the Public Works Department. I have a very brief presentation on this project. Um, it's the 2024 Cross Connection Project. This project's aligned with our strategic plan for infrastructure, climate change, and environmental sustainability. <clears throat> Some people may be uh, familiar with what a cross connection is, but for those that don't, a cross connection is when a storm drain is connected to our sewer system. The picture on the left shows a cross connection that will be removed with this project. The grate collects storm water and feeds it into the city sewer system. To remove this cross connection, this project will install storm drain pipe to reject flows from this storm drain to uh, a storm drain network. This project provides numerous benefits for the city. Directing storm water into the sewer system can overwhelm capacity during heavy rainfall which can lead to sewer overflows, backups, and street flooding, which can be hazardous. By removing the cross connections, it helps reduce this risk. 
In addition, by diverting stormwater away from the sewer, we avoid unnecessary treatment costs at the water treatment plant. This project will remove 11 cross connections around Reno. There'll be two at 5th Street and Evans, two at 4th Street and Morrill, four at 4th Street and Quincy, one at 4th Street and Montello, one at Vassar, and one at Anson Drive at Keystone Avenue. We advertised this project in January. We opened bids February 15th, and if approved today, this would go to construction this spring. Okay, thank you. Could you go Which back way? to your uh, picture again? Sure. This All right, one. I just want to make sure everyone understands. So what you're saying is that historically, stormwater, it rains, we have stormwater, that was routed into the sewer system, and then it was treated, and then maybe increasing the, you know, increasing the amount of water coming into the sewer system. Yes. And then all of that gets discharged into the truck and has to meet certain water quality standards. That is right? correct, yes. So my question for you is, is this going to then go straight to the river, or is there a pretreatment before this water goes to the river? No, this, will, this will act like the rest of our storm drain system, where it collects the stormwater runoff during rain events, and then it goes into our storm drain system, and most of that does discharge into the water. Okay. Yeah. Well, my question is, and I know I'm going to use a term most people probably don't know, but it's our MS4 permit. That's our master stormwater permit mm -hmm. that I think it's issued by DEP. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And then we have to monitor the stormwater going into the river. And so I guess my question for you is, I thought that there was some kind of pretreatment or some kind of treatment to take out nit uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, whatever, uh, but that doesn't happen or does that happen in some places? I'm not super familiar with that, to be honest. Okay, well, I saw um, Trina I can, here yeah. or Carrie. <laughs> Carrie, maybe, or Trina, yeah. Uh, Kerry Koski, Director of Public Works. Uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, Vice Mayor, the pretreatment happens at the with the, with the sewer, not with the storm drain. So um, only in certain certain cases where we like out here in front of City Hall, we've got a storm scepter, which you're fam very familiar with, where we collect storm water goes into this big. Uh, a big storm scepter and then uh, debris and that and sort of thing is removed out of the um, storm water and then, then it goes into the river. River, But generally, we don't have that sort of situation. Okay. So in this case, right here at City Hall, we have something that intercepts the twigs, leaves, and debris. Correct. The larger materials. Correct. Keeps them out of there. And then you have to clean that out, I guess? Correct. Maintenance and operations has a schedule on when they come in and they use their big back trucks. And you've probably all seen that um, happen here. It, I think they do it quarterly. But I mean, is that, that's rare then? Most Typically, of the system? it is, yes. Okay. All right. Well, I guess I just wondered how we um, keeping in, in um, how we keep current with the MS4 requirements if we don't do anything? <laughs> how, do, how do we make sure the water doesn't exceed values? I'm going to turn it over to Trina okay. Magoon. Like, for example, my understanding is the biggest storm drain is coming out of Steamboat Creek. That's our biggest point, uh, non-point source. Do you want to just speak to that? Well, sure. Good morning. Trina Magoon, Director of Utility Services. So in addition to the occasional storm scepter unit that we have on some of our storm drains at, at particular outfalls, we also have um, sumps in our catch basins, and maintenance and operations does come out, and they vector those. A storm scepter unit um, not only picks up the twigs and weeds and things like that, it also picks up the first flush with some petrochemicals and other things that you'll find on the roadway system. Um, with regard to something like Steamboat Creek that drains naturally into the Truckee River and um, is one of our most polluted um, water bodies that we have here, it does not have um, a requirement in our MS4 at this point. Uh, that may come at some future point um, to help clean that up, but that is, that's really a community-wide. It comes from the watershed. It's a very huge um, watershed that drains to Steamboat Creek, okay. but that does drain naturally okay. into uh, the Truckee River. So the point. point of this project is mostly to help our sewer plant. Yes, yes okay. exactly. To reduce uh, peak flows during storm events that go to the sewer All plant. Right. Well, thank you very much. Are there questions from anyone else? All right, great job. Uh, seeing none, could you put up the recommended motion again? Yes. Move to approve staff recommendations. Thank you. Second. All right, we have a motion from Mr. Reese, second from Ms. Taylor. Any comments on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, team, for the good explanations in a very short amount of time. 
Um, we're going to move on to opening up the public hearings on item C. Um, and let me just uh, get my script here for that. Um, let the record reflect that the council's opening the public hearing at item C1 and C3 together, C1, C2, C3 together. Um, and I got to ask our Madam Clerk. Uh, this item was continued from another meeting and did not require re-noticing. So Madam Clerk, was any correspondence received? Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. No correspondence was received on this item. Well, I think we did get some correspondence. I actually. believe that's the applicant's representative. So if you'd like, we can have someone come up for public comment. Okay. Well, when we asked that question, maybe it's a question to the attorney. When we asked the question, was correspondence received? We received some correspondence, I think, asking for a continuance. Is that correct? We did receive correspondence um, from the applicant's representative mm -hmm. asking for a continuance not to a date certain. So. Okay. So um, before we go over this, and we still have to consider that request, is that right? It's, um, you don't have to consider the request in terms of necessarily voting on it. You can just postpone the item <clears throat> under 1808-306. Okay. All right, well, my understanding is um, we shall open and we have to take an affirmative action by the body to postpone, but I'm not sure. But anyway, let's just move forward uh, before we take any other action. Um, do any council members need to make any disclosures on this item? Okay, seeing none. Um, and then, Madam Clerk, do we have any public comment on C1? Andrew Diss. Okay. All right, welcome, Mr. Diss. Morning, Madam Vice Mayor and Council Members. For the record, my name is Andrew Diss. I'm the Senior Vice President for Morello Gaming. We own and operate the Grand Sierra Resort, which is located next to uh, the applicant's site that's before you today. Um, I, I would urge this body not to grant the request for an extension today. I'll hold off on what I was planning on saying in public comment until you make a decision if you're going to grant the continuance. Um, the applicants asked for a continuance previously, which was granted by council, and it's my understanding that it is within council's discretion on whether to grant that continuance. It's um, general practice to grant one continuance, but to grant another one, to a date that is uncertain in the future. We just don't want to see this dragged out. We would like to see some resolution today. So thank okay. you. Okay. All right. And would that apply to C2 and C3 as well? Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And then, Madam Clerk, is there any other public comment? We have none registered. Okay. So um, I understand we have the request from the applicant for a continuance. So I'm going to open it up to council. Do we have any discussion or questions from council? Madam Vice Mayor. Yes, please, Mr. Reese. So my um, comments are really directed to the city attorney's office. I have reviewed um, the Reno, Reno Municipal Code. I understand in the past our general practice has been essentially to grant one continuance anytime one is requested, right? And, and I think that many of us on that body, including some who are long-serving members, have believed that that was the appropriate standard. One continuance was always given essentially without question, comment, or pass. But it is my understanding that now the city attorney's office has reviewed um, the section of Reno Municipal Code and believes that there is a different requirement, that we have an obligation to provide a continuance when it's requested up to two times. Is that accurate? I mean, I, we're trying to get some uh, sense more about the procedure, not about the merits of this particular inquiry, but more about the procedure so that we are clear when things appear on our agenda, the public is expecting to hear them. People come out for them. We as council members have prepared for those uh, hearings by reading the materials, meeting with staff, doing all the work up. So I, I want to understand what the city attorney's recommendation is for us in this instance. Uh, Jasmine Mehta, for the record, under um, RMC 1808-306-B, it allows the applicant to request a postponement any time up to 5 p.m. before the day of the hearing, which was done in this case. It's, it then provides that in all other cases, the public hearing shall be opened and affirmative action by the body needs to be had in order to postpone the item. But in this case, the applicant met the requirement for the, the request to postpone. Um, a, another section of that same 
um, code says that it cannot be postponed by the applicant more than twice or the applicant or the application becomes invalid. So that's why we've we've determined that no they get they get two opportunities to to postpone. Um, because this was noticed for a date certain, um, our recommendation is that it be opened for public comment to be heard and then and then the council can vote to postpone it or they can you can just take it off the calendar but since it's open I would recommend that you vote to post you know, vote on the request to postpone well so it requires me to ask two questions one is what if we cannot affirmatively vote to postpone it what happens to it um, meaning no one moves for that I'm not saying they won't but if if no one moves for that then I think it would just automatically be postponed by the code Okay, and that, that was really the question. And then, uh, Madam Vice Mayor, if I may. Yes, please, Mr. Uh, Ms. Mehta, um, I want to understand why, and this is a general question, but why do we have postponements of any kind? And there is a due process element, I suppose, to any of our decisions that we make in the appellate practice of what we do. So is it because we're trying to give parties the opportunity to marshal their resources, their facts? What, what is the postponement's purpose in a due process sense? Um, I think there's, it, it, it's probably stemming from the fact that there are deadlines, once an application comes in, staff has deadlines under which to process those applications and bring them to council with a recommendation. Um, oftentimes, more time is necessary for the applicant to work out issues, perhaps with their neighbors, with, um, you know, neighborhood concerns, community concerns in order to um, bring a package that would be, um, you know, palatable for approval. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to follow up question. So this particular application, the way I understand it, from the Planning Commission received a recommendation, a uh, unanimous recommendation of denial. Is that correct? Um, I don't remember if it was unanimous, but yes, that is correct. Okay. It was a recommendation for denial. Okay. And then my question is, if, if it is postponed, is that just postponing our action or does it have to go back to the Planning Commission? For example, what if they come back in a year? And it's been a year since the Planning Commission reviewed it. It would, only, it would not necessarily have to go back to the Planning Commission. If they amended their application and, and the amendment was substantial enough to change it that they would have to come back, it would, it would essentially go through the Planning Commission again. Process. Okay, that's interesting. Mr. Reese, did you have anything else? Anyone else? I, I did have one other comment, yeah, sure. and this is really for my colleagues. Um, I'm not going to move for the postponement because I don't think it's appropriate, meaning I would have rather have heard it on the merits today, but I understand by not taking action, meaning no motion, that the effect of that is the postponement. Is that correct, Ms. Mehta? Under the code, that's my understanding. So, again, the reason why I'm concerned about um, normally, I am someone who has said if a person comes and requests a continuance, that is their essentially their right to do it. Um, I, I believe that's important, but I also believe there's a balancing of interest with the public who has prepared to be here. I, I don't know who's ass assigned in to speak. There has been at least one opposition, but not given us the full context of the opposition by Mr. Dis. But I, I think. We prepare, our staff prepares, everyone's prepared, but I understand what the code requires. So thank you so much for your um, ability to sort of highlight those nuances in the code. Okay, and to confirm, I mean, you think it's uh, approved by RMC? That, that, in other words, the applicant, by asking for a postponement, is basically saying they're not ready to discuss it with us. Uh, that's a net that, effect. That's correct. And so they have, um, they are all but withdrawing in a way. I mean, they're saying, we're not ready to talk to you. And we may never be ready to talk to you, but we don't want necessarily a denial given what the Planning Commission has said. And that a good majority of the Planning Commission recommended denial. Is that? Um, well, I can't speculate as to what yeah. the applicant is thinking, but um, but yes, it, it, they're... they're uh, request for a postponement is that, you know, they're not ready. Yeah, at this got point it. In time. Okay. Let me ask. Uh, yes, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, 
Ms. Mayta, can you just, do you recommend from a legal perspective that we make a postponement or hear the item? Um, from a legal perspective, the code says that the applicant has the right to postpone if they've provided their notice, their request by 5 p.m. before the day of the hearing, and which they did. So okay, in so this I case, would make a motion, or I would inter I would be happy to do that for discussion purposes and see where I, it happens, Madam right. Vice Chair. So you're uh, making a motion for what? Uh, to continue the item all to right. a date uncertain. All right. Is there a second to that motion? A second. Okay, we have a second um, from Ms. Ebert. So open for discussion. Ms. Taylor, would you like to discuss it? I just, um, thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. I just don't see the harm in going for um, giving the applicant a little bit more time based on the request. They met all the requirements needed to ask for a continuance. And um, depending on where this goes in the future, I think it's good policy for us to grant this continuance. Okay. And then, Ms. Ebert, did you have anything? I agree with Councilmember Taylor that if it's allowed, that we should allow it. Yeah, on, in good faith for the applicant. Okay. And Mr. Martinez, anything? Yeah, thanks so much, Madam Vice Mayor. I think um, I'm leaning towards having all the resources that were already put into place to getting us to this point of the public hearing. Um, it's hard for me to come to a place to support um, the motion, and I would rather hear it and make sure that we make a decision on this just because everybody's ready to hear it out. And so I am coming, I'm in a difficult place to support postponing this hearing. Okay, so you would like to hold the hearing today now. And I will, Mr. Thornley. Um, Ms. Maida, could you help me a little bit understand? My understanding is that by, by making the request, the item is functionally already postponed. Is that correct? Yes. So holding the hearing today is not an option that's available to us. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So given that, Mr. Martinez, any further thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess I was misunderstanding. It sounds, at least from what I'm reading, it's saying it's the public hearing shall be open and affirmative action by the body is required to postpone a decision. And so uh, from my understanding, I thought we had the ability to either hear it or postpone it at this point. But okay. it sounds like I am not in so the right I, understanding of it. I think that that's the catch-all for if they miss that 5 o'clock deadline. If they make the request prior to 5 o'clock the day before, then it requires an act of the body to continue the item. Is that correct? I think it would actually that be is. the reverse in a way. Like what if they made, like we've experienced, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we've experienced people requesting postponements after 5 p.m., not meeting this, and, and the council has voted to agree with that or disagree with that. No, that's right. So if they miss the 5 o'clock deadline, if they make the request after 5 o'clock yeah. or they make it, um, if something goes sideways uh, during the hearing or they need more time to get exactly. more information, they ask for continuance, and then the council needs to make the decision, should we grant that time or should exactly. we not? But by meeting the deadline, by making that request in advance of 5 o'clock yesterday, there is nothing to hear today. Gotcha. All right. Uh, yes, Thank you, Madam colleague. Vice Mayor. I, I suppose for my part, um, again, I, I don't really want to talk about the merits of the underlying request it is some procedural minutia that we're really talking about, about how this body approaches continuances. And I understand from the city attorney's office um, that they have met the requirements by having requested the continuance by fi before five o'clock yesterday. And as a result, it really is incumbent upon us uh, not to um, hear the item because it has functionally been continued by their action. What I want the public to understand is two things. One is that sometimes in government, the procedural and legal minutia of a thing sort of swamps the substantive issues, and it's hard to access. I mean, the public doesn't really understand why we have the procedural rules that we have, but sometimes we have them. Um, for my part, I was interested in hearing the item today, but understand that it 
it will not be heard today. And that's why I'm not going to support the motion for continuance because I don't think it is functionally necessary, um, but I believe it will have the same impact. The one thing I will say is there was, in the second part of this was there was some new nuance to it, which was, would we be able to set a date certain? Meaning they have functionally asked for a continuance. Is this body in a position to say it will only be continued to this date? And I think Ms. Vice Mayor Dewar raises the important question like extending out the thought process, which is what if they don't come back for a year? Well, we know that the application essentially sort of evaporates into the universe, but I don't know whether I agree that it does not have to be reheard by planning, especially because you've said if they make a substantial amendment, it would have to be. Um, I don't want to waste the planning commission's time either. Are we as a body able to affirmatively say we would continue it, but on the condition that it came back on a date certain, meaning we picked a date in May? and said it must come back then. Is that a condition that the code would allow? I think Mr. Williams has uh, some input on that oh, question. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Carter Williams, associate planner for the record. I just wanted to put on the record that there is a time for, uh, a, a, a clock, time clock that starts. And from what is Tell us about it. So there's a 90 day time frame that they have to bring this back or to the, the city council in order to be heard or it automatically invalidates. Okay. And Mr. Williams, first of all, thank you for your work up on this, because I think in the discussions we've had uh, in our staff briefings, they've been outstanding. Um, and I think the staff report really shows your excellent work in this area. Where is that time 90 days requirement? Where, where do we find that? It's within the postponement section of code. It is, so the okay. same So section. the same code, 18.083006. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so what you're saying is it would have to be a meeting of the city council that would occur prior to 90 days. Because after 90 days... So it, it, I, I guess just to clarify, so the 90 days is, is um, they have to, re, it says in code that they have to reactivate it. So it could be that they schedule it before 90 days and that, that satisfies the reactivation requirement. Um, but from staff's perspective, we want, to, we want to get these on, I mean, as soon as possible. So yeah. it, again, the men moving. So, so essentially, would, I use the word withdrawn, but really what it is is it's a pause. Correct. It pauses all the time clocks. Yes. Is that right? Except this 90-day time clock that they have to schedule it. But what if they, I mean, if they come back in and say we're, quote, reactivating our application, um, would you then schedule for the next council meeting following that? I think, yeah, I think that would or be Or as soon as possible, I mean, within yeah, our so usual time frames. Yeah, the, the code gives us the, the ability to invalidate it if they aren't able to show a, a meaningful um, a meaningful directionality or, or the, like, the, if, if they're not, if they're going to say, oh, we're going to schedule it six months from now, that's not a reactivation for us. It would be fairly immediate that we would want to see it. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so we have a, a motion and a second. Uh, I'm not seeing any requests for further comment. Are there? All right, everyone in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, please say no. Opposed. No. no. All right, motion dies 2-3, uh, two, three. or 3-2, three, I guess would be the way to say it. Okay, but what that means for everyone listening is that the application um, does continue on. Um, it is on pause. Um, they must reactivate the application within 90 days and schedule it for a timely hearing with the city council. If they make a change to their application that's significant, it would need to go back to the planning commission and you at uh, the planning staff would make that determination. Okay. All right. Well, that sort of settles it for me. Is there any further comments or questions? I think we've summarized where we stand. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Appreciate it. And Madam Vice Mayor, we've taken no action then on C1, Correct. 2, and 3. And so by operation of our rules, we would move on to then C4? Correct. Four. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So we're moving on to C4, um, which is um, the Casa de Rey. Let me make sure I got this. Casa del Rey, historic resource designation. And who on staff is here to present that? Do you want to come up? Madam Vice Mayor, may I ask, we have seen a number of historic uh, designations in the last several weeks. Uh, both of these continue to be in the historic Ward 1 neighborhood. Um, I do not require a presentation for either Charlie 4 or Charlie 5, and am prepared to make a motion if you so okay. desire. Well, I would like to have our staff come up, if you wouldn't mind. Um, 
I was just going to ask you to speak on the fact that we have had quite a few of those. And is there a change in our process? Or why are we suddenly having more of these than we have historically had? So, uh, Jeff Sorry, Foster, Madam so Vice Mayor, if I would, can you open the public hearing before oh, we apologize. go into? Oh, I apologize. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We jumped right in. So let the record reflect that the council is opening the public hearing on item C4. Uh, Madam Clerk, was proper notice given? Any correspondence received? Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. This item was properly noticed, and we did really receive one letter of support, um, which has been included in the record. Okay. Um, one letter of support. And then any um, council members need to make any disclosures? Anyone? All right. So, Madam Clerk, any public comment on this? We have none registered. All right. Um, any discussion or questions from the council on this item? I'm simply asking a question. Um, I just wanted to know, I'm, I'm thrilled why we're having so many of these come now. So Jeff Foster, associate planner for the record, I'm going to defer to uh, Megan Berner to speak to that. Okay. Good morning. Uh, Megan Berner, arts and culture manager for the record. Um, so the reason that we have had more of these local designations recently is that um, a little over a year ago we hired a person for our historic preservation to kind of be that point person, Melissa Hafey, in our arts and culture department. And she has really made an, a concerted effort to do outreach to owners of historic properties that are eligible. Wow. And through that outreach, we have received interest from owners and she has helped them through this process. And okay. so that's why you're seeing that's more That's a of these. great explanation. And then further, could you just say what it means to be uh, put on um, the, essentially the historic, yeah. sure. explain what we're doing here today as far as a historic, one is a historic landmark overlay and I think the other one is something different. So can you, I thought it was. Right. Same thing, yeah. excuse they me, are both, both are historic, historic landmark overlay. Yeah, so in our code in Title 18, when we designate something as a local resource, there is a, a zoning change to put that historic overlay over the, the, the property boundaries. Um, what that does is that um, it gives it some protections in regards to historic preservation. Uh, it will trigger, depending on what kinds of modifications are being to, made to the exterior of the building. The idea is to preserve the historical integrity of these architectural resources or other resources that get put onto this local register. And so um, what happens is if the owner decides that they want to do something, say replace their roof or windows, and those are part of the historic integrity of the building, it will trigger a certificate of appropriateness, which will go to the Historical Resources Commission. And so anything that is on our local register will get reviewed by them if there are these sort of changes happening so that we can make sure that those upgrades, renovations are in line with the historical fabric. And then, um, can, you may not know the answer, so I apologize for putting you on the spot, but if a home is actually moved or a building is moved, um, can it still go on to the historic, have a historic landmark overlay? Does it have to be a building in place or can someone apply for this designation if a building's been moved? So uh, the answer is yes, they can apply. It depends though whether the majority of that sort of historical integrity and context has been preserved. So um, I believe that there is a, I don't know actually if this one is on the register, but there has been, there have been historical properties that have been moved that have been placed on the register to my knowledge. Okay, good to know. Uh, let me ask, open for questions, comments on the item. Madam Vice Mayor, uh, Ms. Berner, thank you so much for the explanation. I think um, Vice Mayor Dewar is being very gracious because uh, she's not indicated that she really fought to have the budget augmented to add the additional person who would be able to conduct this research. So it, it is true that in the budgetary process, we don't have um, sometimes the ability to make huge changes, but sometimes small changes are very worth it. And Vice Mayor uh, Dewar, I thank you for making and helping advocate for this position resource because as a result, we now have the outreach going on to be able to make the designation. So each one of these are, I think, a lasting legacy to the HRC and to Vice Mayor Dewar. So I'm happy to move to uphold the recommendations the Historic Resource Commission and refer for a second reading and adoption. Okay. 
And that would be item C4. We're actually going to take these separately. Um, and uh, do you need anything? Okay, so may I get a second? Oh, sorry. Before we do that, oh. we need the city attorney to read the oh, bill thank number you. into the record. Thank you. C3. We're on C4. Oh, I'm sorry, C3. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. This is ordinance introduction, bill number 7261, case number LDC 24-00039, Casa del Rey Historic Resource Designation, ordinance to amend Title 18, Chapter 18.02 of the Reno Municipal Code, entitled Zoning Rezoning, a plus or minus 0 0.12 acre site from single family residential, eight units per acre, SF8 to plus or minus 0 0.12 acres of SF8, with the historic landmark HL overlay zoning district subject to its locate uh, subject is located at 990 Joaquin Miller Drive in the Newlands Historic District and has a master plan land use designation of single family neighborhood SF Ward One. All right. Does that satisfy you? Yeah. All right, wait, so we have a motion from Mr. Reese and I'll second it for uh, discussion. Um, is there any discussion? No? All right, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Congratulations to our team, another house on the historic landmark overlay zoning district. And then Mr. Foster for item, uh, excuse me, not Mr. Foster. Um, yeah, right. So for item C5, we're going to open the record reflect that the council is opening the public hearing on item C5. And again, Madam Clerk, was proper notice given and any correspondence received on this one? Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, public comment or proper notice was given and we did receive one letter of support. Okay. And I'm going to go to council disclosures. Does any council member have a disclosure? Um, seeing none, um, I'm going to ask our city attorney to uh, read the ordinance. This is another ordinance introduction, bill number 7262. No, 63. No, case number LDC 24-00040, Garrett Humphrey House, Historic Resource Designation, Ordinance to Men, Title 18, Chapter 18.02 of the Reno Municipal Code, entitled Zoning, Rezoning, a plus or minus 0 0.11 acre site from multifamily residential, 14 units per acre, MF14, to plus or minus 0 0.11 acres of MF14 with historic landmark HL overlay zoning district. Subject property is located at 655 South Arlington Avenue in the Newlands Historic District and has a master plan land use designation of mixed neighborhood, MX Ward 1. All right. Um, and then, Madam Clerk, do we have any public comment? We have none registered. All right. Any discussion or questions from Council? On this one, um, just I'm going to just say kudos again, and and to Mr. Reese's point earlier, if it were not for Melissa Hafey, we would not be here today. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm so so thankful that we authorized the position, Mr. Manager. You know, I did push really hard for this yes, for did. eight years in a row, I think, um, and I'm so glad we got such a good person who's very committed to her craft and her her. Uh, you know, her area of expertise. Um, so with that, um, we looking for a motion. Madam Vice Mayor, I move to uphold the recommendation of the Historic Resource Commission to refer Bill 7262 for a second reading and adoption. All right, and I'll second again. So we have a motion from Mr. Reese, second from myself. Any comments on the motion? All right, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Um, the next item we are looking at is uh, D1. Did, did you want to come up? Is there any public comment? We did receive, sorry one letter of concern that has been distributed to the Reno City Council. We do not have any public comment registered at this time. Okay. And it says supplemental supporting materials, so additional materials were added. Just the presentation. Okay, yes. thank you. 
Do you want to give us the presentation? I know this is a big ask, so I want to make Absolutely. sure that, uh, and just so folks know, I guess the next step if we do approve this is to go to the Debt Management Commission? Yes. All right. So, and I think, uh, okay. Vicki Van Buren, Director of Finance. Um, good morning, Vice Mayor and Council Members. Before you today, we have a resolution for approval to move forward to the Washoe County Debt Management Commission to propose general obligation sewer bond issuance, and it's for a very large sewer project that the city's working on right now. So I'm going to move forward. This, this aligns with the strategic plan that Council has under infrastructure. It also in, aligns with climate change and environmental sustainability as we get into this, and fiscal s sustainability as well. And so this project is, uh, just to give you a, a summary of it, it's an indirect potable reuse project in the North Valleys, and it does recycled water produced by the Renostead Water Reclamation Facility, and it'll be treated to drinking water standards. And then, as you can see on the, the slide there, um, it's piped about seven miles north to be injected into the groundwater aquifer, and eventually it becomes available as drinking water, and that's what this project would do once it's built out. Um, it's a partnership between the Reno, City of Reno and the Truckee Meadows Water Authority, and the project uh, cost is anticipated right now at $221 million for this project. It is a very large project. Uh, the cost for this project is split 70% City of Reno and 30% Truckee Meadows Water Authority. So that ends up being around $154 million for the City of Reno. And what's before you today would be a bond for a portion of that would be $70 million to move forward with, with uh, going forward with the bond. The remaining portion of that would be available from cash. We have cash on hand for that. Um, there has been a $3 million grant that has been approved already for a portion of that. And then a $30 million grant is in the works as well. We have not received notice on that as well. But if those were received, that would re reduce the amount of cash that we would have to put forward out of the pot for that. But we do have the money set aside for it. Um, the operating cost on an ongoing basis would be 50% Reno and 50% Truckee Meadows Water Authority. So if you remember, we originally came back to count, we came to council ask with this same ask back in August of 2022. So it's been almost two years. Originally, the estimate was $118 million. Um, Today's estimate is $221 million, and really that's an 87% cost increase. And the reason for that is we the cost for materials have gone up over the last three years from the point that this started the design process and where we actually are today. It's just, it's a long process and it's a huge project. And so what's happened is that 70% increase in the water materials and wastewater costs over three years just in building these type of projects. So that's really the big bulk of it. There were a few things that have been added. Um, the PFAS treatment process was added from the original um, design. The public education and enhancement center was added. And then some enhanced piping and pumping capacity as well has contributed to that. But the, the, the bulk of it is the materials are costing more. And we're just at that point in this phase. So when you look at the existing debt, this would be debt that would be paid out of the sewer fund. The sewer fund itself right now has two bonds associated with it. It has a 2016 sewer refunding bonds, and these bonds were a refunding of bonds that were originally issued in 2024 and 2025. I'm, I'm sorry, 2004 and 2005. Um, these are, bonds, when they were reissued, were $41 million in that issuance, and they actually pay off in July of 25, so they pay off in about a year. We have the 2020 sewer bonds, which were issued for the uh, Riswarf expansion, that 4MGD expansion that was done there, and that was the $55 million issuance. That's the last issuance that we've done as far as sewers been related. So really, once that one bond pays off in 25, we will only have this bond, the 2020, plus this new one, um, if council approves that. When you look at net pledge, pledge revenues, this is what we would be bringing forward to, along with a whole package to the Debt Management Commission. And so this shows you a history of where we've been as far as net pledge re revenues for the sewer fund. 
So it compares to total revenues to operating expenses. It does not compare it to capital. It's just ongoing operating. So your net ple pledged revenues there show an existing coverage in the prior years of anywhere from in 2019, we had 6.76% uh, times coverage. And in the current year, we have 4.3 times coverage. What is actually required uh, to move forward is one times coverage. I would never recommend that, but we are well above that. So if you look to the future, this table shows you the future of net pledge revenues. And this is really a very conservative look at it because if you look at the net pledge revenues for each year there, we just take the current year that we anticipate and we do that going forward. We obviously know that those revenues will increase because we have a, the, the sewer fund increases their fees by CPI each year for their user fees. So we know those are going to increase. But as far as building this table, this is the ultimate conservative build on this. So you'll know that um, it really shows that we have coverage that's well above what's needed to go ahead and make this um, move forward to issue this debt in the $70 million. Um, the middle portion shows you this new debt, and it'll be about $5.6 million. Um, in payments each year, and then the coverage is 4.3, and then you'll see when that new debt kicks off in 25 out there, it goes back to the 4.3 and stays at that steady going forward. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Here. Thank you so much. That was great. Very fast, very detailed, but great. Um, questions on this. This is a big decision, $70 million uh, in bond and indebtedness repaid by the sewer fund. Yes. Um, and with the benefit, if I understand it from this advanced purified water, of unlike all other sewer projects, which are then the water is thrown away, either either basically into the river yes. or put or reused, you know, in a application. Um, this one is scheduled to actually create new water. It is. It's a, it's a true resiliency project. So Create new water. Mm -hmm. And those of us on Tumwa have had a chance to go on some trips to see other projects that have done this. And uh, it's been fairly remarkable. I, I got to see, I think, five at this point. Others, I think, I've seen even more. Um, but it is really an uh, incredible technology. The question I have is, once we get through this piece, uh, will we... What will we have constructed at that point? Well, and I think this is a technical okay. question. Uh, good morning, Vice Mayor. Um, Joe Coudre, um, Senior Civil Engineer for the record. And Trini Magoon. Director of Utilities for the record. Would you restate the question? Yeah, me? I was knowing after the expenditure of the $70 million that you're asking us to move forward into possible debt issuance, what will we have? We're still in the design phase, so we are moving toward a 100% design and then advertising the project for construction early next year. So I don't know if that answers the question. So, Well, what I'm trying to say is what is the project? Hi, Trina McGoon, Director of Utility Services again. Thank you. Um, we're actually here to request um, that we move forward to debt commission. Uh, it would go through that process, then it would be Back, brought back to the board for the first guaranteed maximum price by the CMAR contractor for the project. Once constructed, which we'll, we'll take that to about the end of the year to get to that point when construction starts early next year. If we move forward, uh, construction will commence through about 2028, middle of 2028. At that point, we will be able to uh, accomplish a couple of things. We'll be able to uh, move our effluent water from Riz Wharf, the Reno Stead Water Reclamation Facility, to this new advanced purified water facility. It would then be pumped up to the existing American Flat Farm, <clears throat> pardon me, where we would irrigate with that effluent, uh, cleaned up effluent water, uh, the existing American Flat Farm for a number of years while we prove this up to, the, to our regulator, the NDEP. Um, and then once that's proved up to them, um, it, it's injected into the ground, ultimately pulled out of the ground, and then at that point it is a new water resource, as you mentioned before. I guess I'm asking, I'll try a third time. Sorry. What I'm trying to ask is, uh, is this money going to pay for advanced treatment at our Riz Wharf? Is it going to pay for piping? Is it going to pay for a well to pull it back up? What physical features will we have 
uh, as part of this project. I understand. You go ahead. I'm, gonna pull the figure while yeah, you I'm, I'm happy just to address some of that. So the fund, the capital will largely pay for a site adjacent to the Reno set water reclamation facility, which is an advanced purified water facility. That's the bulk of the cost. Another large portion of that is for the pipeline up to the site where the injection will occur. So it's the pipeline to the site north of the airport. Okay. And then do we need a well to pull this water back out? And that's right. So at that site, there's injection wells and extraction wells. There, are, there is also some um, PFAS treatment that's been discussed before council sure. previously. That'll be incorporated into the project. Okay. And then I guess my question to part two, and I don't mind waiting if other people have questions. Yes. So I'll come back to me. Uh, Ms. Taylor. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. For me, I want to um, understand, I'm, Today we're looking at the financing of this project. There is a project, but I, my, I'm going to keep my questions to the actual financing and the bond. So, Vicki, if you want to come up, please. Um, so, has Tumwa committed their 30 percent of the financing for this project yet? Tumwa initially was going to pay for all of theirs with cash. Okay. Um, so we don't need if we commit 70, we we're sure that we have the other 30. They from. are, and they're still committed to do that. They are actually looking at the SRF financing like we are now too. They don't necessarily need it, but it is a good alternative because the rates are so low. So they are looking at it as well, but they don't need it. They are committed at cash either okay. way. My second question is, I understand we're going to drop off $55 million in debt in 2025 when we repay that, but how does this bonding impact us for other citywide projects? Are there things that we're not going to be able to be considered for or our rating, or was this always planned? I know we have some things coming up with maybe a public um, a fire station, those other projects. Well, this particular bond is based on the sewer revenues, so it's backed by the sewer revenues to pay for it, which would be a different funding source than like your fire station, which would be just out of general obligation, um, general fund funding. So it would not be impacting that because it's separate to this. It's separate to the sewer, sewer fund. Yes. Okay. And then my third question or fourth question, I can't remember. You had on the screen something that said coverage. And I was wondering if you, that there was a number on the far right, what that actually means when we're looking at the. Let's see if I can get back to yeah. that. So what that coverage means, if I go back to this other one right here, this one shows net pledged revenue. And the definition of net pledged revenue is the total revenues minus the operating expenses. So operating just means salary, wages, benefits, services, and supplies, does not include capital, just to operate. So it takes that net pledged revenue and compares it to our debt service. So that's that ratio that you're going to get. So you'll see here on the side, we have 40 million in net pledge revenues and we have 9.5 million in existing debt. So that ratio is 4.3. Um, we're only required to have a one times ratio, which I would never recommend, but that is the requirement. It's just one times. So on the next slide or the next yes. slide. It's the as same calculation, but this one you can see is, is prior years, 2019 showing where we've been. This is showing how it would be impacted in the future if we add this debt. So we're still at 4.3 now, and then going forward, we would be at 4.3 once that one drops off next year. So. Okay, perfect. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank right. you, Madam Vice Mayor. Yeah, absolutely. Any other council members? Madam Vice Mayor. Yeah, please, Mr. Reese. So, Ms. Van Buren, I like Councilmember Taylor sort of separated this into two things. One was the budget impact, what it meant in the financial services ten, uh, sense, because of course the very first thing that we're all charged with is the safe resource planning and to shepherd our resources of our taxpayers well. And I think your um, entire presentation proves that that's uh, absolutely something that you and your team have done to allow us to make the decision about the project. So I am absolutely satisfied about the financial wherewithal of the sewer fund to handle the debt obligation and believe that when you go to the next commission that you'll be required to go to, that they will similarly see it. I assume their primary issue is coverage, right? They will look at that last column and say, yes. clearly you have sufficient resources, I guess, for time.
times the resources, and I understood your hesitancy to go down to one. I suppose I don't know that we've ever been at that level, um, but fortunately, you have also increased our you know, bond ratings, our cities uh, wherewithal to leverage the type of resources that we need to make the commitments financially. So for my part, I am uh, absolutely satisfied with the financial analysis that you've done. And Councilmember Taylor, um, I do have the privilege of serving on Tumwa, and Tumwa has also made the similar commitments. Their ability to pay for it in cash or decide to finance it, that's something that we have not crossed that bridge yet, but the commitment is there. Um, so I'll leave that alone for my piece about the financial side of this. Okay. I do think it's important to talk about the project a little bit because um, what we do uh, and what we budget for and what we prioritize our spending on is a reflection of our shared values as a community and as a council. And so I just want to uh, sort of highlight um, Council Member or Vice Mayor Dewar and I have attended a number of advanced water purification facilities uh, with the team looking at them. And it's incredibly uh, uh, scientifically amazing and awe-inspiring to think about what's being done. But I'll say the potential project benefits have been highlighted, but it obviously provides a local, reliable, drought-proof water source, right? That is something that in the desert we're always obviously talking about. I also believe it's important because it reduces the amount of reclaimed water that is being discharged into Riswurf into the flood-prone Swan Lake by up to 2 million gallons per day. So this is part of our continued commitment to the North Valley's community to reduce the impacts that happen when um, flooding does occur there. Uh, obviously, it also improves the quality of the remaining reclaimed water that's discharged in Swan Lake because this facility would be a plus water, right? So that's an exciting part of the component. I think it just vastly increases our resiliency and sustainability in the regional water portfolio because as Council Vice Mayor Dewar said, it is is um, new water, right? It is producing something. Um, I think it's an innovative treatment process that's certainly tailored for West Coast uh, communities because uh, it'll be an important part of our decision to move forward. So um, we, it's been demonstrated to be viable. I'm excited about it. I think we should all be honored because it really is a legacy-defining project for this community. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Madam Vice Mayor, yes. if I may. Um, Ms. Van Buren, I know that you have a flair for the dramatic and you're probably saving this for Monday, but um, do you have news that you'd like to share with the group I related do, to our actually. bond rating? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Manager Thornley. I, yesterday we actually received notice that uh, the city's bond rating was upgraded, so it's very to, from exciting what news. what to what? We were upgraded from an A1 to an AA3. And then our outlook was upgraded from a revised from a positive outlook to a stable outlook. And this is really big news for the city. So we're very excited about wow. that. Okay, fantastic. So yeah. going from A1 to AA3, is that a one step? Um, it is. Okay. It is. Yeah. And then after AA3, what would be next? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think AA2, but I'm not sure. I think sure. so. Um, okay. But we haven't had a ratings increase for at least about two and a half years or so. So this is a this is a really great step for us. Okay. Um, and we met with Moody's, and you know we we spent a lot of time with Moody's, giving them information, giving them financials, talking to them about the city, you know where the city's going. So it was a it was a really great process, and to see this come to fruition, it's really you know, a great okay. thing for the city. Great. Um, I do have a question still about the actual okay. project, if you could bring okay. back our staff. Um, and you may know, too. I was just wondering, there was, um, we alluded to the Tumwa cost share. Could you just go over the total expected cost and what the cost share breakdown is? Yeah, the total expected cost. Presently is estimated at $220.9 million. 220.9. That's been informed by an independent cost estimator. Also working with our CMAR, which is our contractor, who's not, not for construction, but to advise and pre-construction services. Sure. They've come together on that cost, so that, that's, okay. that's, that's good. They're that's honing in on this cost. Yes. And the $70 and that's a, million. That's a, total, that's a total project. Right. Cost. That's not construction cost. So $70 million would be about a third? Yeah. Right. And then you mentioned Tumwa, and then what's their share supposed to be? 30%. Yeah, thir thir as a percentage, 30%. And then the other 30 would be? Sorry, Trina McGoon, Director of Utility Services. County? 
Uh, no, so this is split between the City of Reno and Tumwa. City of Reno will pay 70% of the upfront costs. Tumwa will pay 30% of the upfront costs. Of the city's 70%, that equals about $154 million. And 84 of the 154 will be paid by cash from the sewer fund. Ah. 70 million would be bonded through SRF or WIFIA. That was my missing piece. Okay. So I think it's important to say that, that the total project's 150. We're gonna pay for part by cash and part by uh, credit through Correct. a bond. Okay, and it's about 50-50 cash and bond, a little bit more cash. Correct. Okay, I, so that's a very nice blend and mix, and I think that's important to say too. You know, what is the total cost of city um, coffers and how are we going about that? And that's excellent news that we have $84 million in the sewer in cash. That's great. Um, and then my other thing was just about the timing. Um, so you say we've got to do phase one and then we have to get full costs and so on and so forth. Um, so how long is phase one and when would you think we would actually be constructing? And does, is this all the money we need for construction? Yes. Uh, again, Trina Magoon, Director of Utility Services. So we are looking for, we're, we are approaching 60% design currently. We are looking to be at 100% design uh, near the end of the year in December. Uh, we're looking in early, probably January, February for an early procurement package for um, long lead item equipment. And then construction is slated to begin. This is from our recent memo here. In the well, construction early in 2025. Right, spring of 2025 with completion in mid-2028. Okay, I got you. 2028. Yes. So in 2028, we may have new water, or would that just begin the beginning of um, recharging that aquifer? Correct. And would we have to wait a certain amount of time then to pull it back? Yes, correct. That is when the project construction is complete. And at that point, we begin irrigating the American Flat Farm, uh, working through that process with our regulator in approving the process. We will then begin injecting it. There'll be another approval process before we can then pull it out and put it into Tumwa's water distribution okay. system. But let me ask this. I mean, we want full approval from DEP before we go build this thing, right? I mean... <laughs> We don't want to build something. Yes, we want certainty that we're spending the money wisely. Correct? Right. So that's why we're, we've gone down this permit pathway to get a permit that's got conditions built into it. We don't have that, but that's that's the vision for where this is going before the construction occurs. Okay. I think that's important, too. Right? We don't want to go build something, and DP has some last-minute concerns. Right? We, we share the same concerns. Okay. Okay. Well, with that, anyone else? Ms. Taylor? Yes. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. I just want, this is more of a comment, and this is on the project side of things. The 87% cost increase that we have seen in this project is, is concerning. Understandable. I understand how we got there. But I would just ask that during the process with the CMAR and when we're getting to a GMP, if, if there is something that we need to do to make sure that we hit these budget numbers, um, that you're keeping us posted with how we can make sure that we don't have cost overruns in this space because 87% is, like I said, it's a little bit much. Again, understood. I know how we got here, but please keep us posted so we don't um, get into that situation again. We definitely will, and I would just like to add that we are also working with our CMAR contractor on value engineering to make sure that you know, bringing them in early, it's one of really the advantages to find those things that we can save money on if possible. Okay. All right. Any, uh, Ms. Ebert, you had something? Yeah, I have some questions. So in this process, we're, we're going to be taking the water, cleaning out, and this is really in regards to the PFAS situation. So we're going to be filtering for PFAS and then injecting the water, correct? Now, as in part of this process, are we checking the soil at all for PFAS before we're injecting it? back into the ground. I'm happy to go take that. So Tom was definitely taking the lead on all the, so the questions about the hydrogeology up the injection sites, they've done a lot of background studies on the background aquifer itself, so the answer is yes. Okay, okay. So we know that we're not pumping it into a an area that has yes. PFAS in the soil. Or understanding what can be mobilized in the soil and what won't be mobilized and understanding the characteristics of that aquifer, yes, that's that's been done. Okay, so when we take the water back out, is this project going to include any kind of testing for when the water is removed? 
So that's definitely a Tom Mock question, but I've heard them give this answer so often that I can present it for them, which is basically, this will be like one of their typical extraction wells. It's another one of their aquifers. They have aquifer storage and recovery systems in the valley. So this is not new for them. And at that point, it, it will be drinking water. They It will go through their normal testing like any other project. But will it be like funded through this process, all of that? There will be initially a lot of testing done as part of this project, but long term, they look at this as one more of their extraction wells. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But, but yes, this, this project will address all those water quality concerns, including extracted water. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Anyone else have any comments, questions? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion. Um, could you put up a resolution, uh, our CFO here? Well, Madam Vice Mayor, I move to adopt the resolution. I was just asking, did it have to be read? In I, the PowerPoint. This, is this, it on the back of the PowerPoint? There it is. Okay. That's what I was looking for. All right. Do you want to read that? Sure. I move to adopt the resolution directing the city clerk to notify the Washoe County Debt Management Commission of the city's proposal to issue general obligation sewer bonds additionally secured by pledge revenues in the maximum principal amount of $70 million. All right. I'm looking for a Second. Second. All right, uh, I have a motion from Mr. Reese, second from Ms. Taylor. Are there any comments or questions on the motion? All right, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. All right, motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, this is a major, major step in our water supply um, and our water um, discharge. So thank you guys for all the work. It is huge. Um, what we're going to do, discretion of the chair, I'm going to... Um, request that we skip item D2 until after we come back from our break and that we continue on with the agenda on D3. And just to know, I'm just, um, I'm, uh, I think the mayor would like to participate in, in that item and she is expected to be here a little later. So for this one is on the audit of the take home vehicles. All right, yes, good morning, everyone. For the record, Emily Kidd, um, internal auditor here at the City of Rideau. I'm here today to provide you with an overview of the take-home vehicles audit. And can you check if your mic's still on? It's not. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, so the purpose of this audit is to the, assess the compliance with documented policies and best practices for our take-home vehicle process. The audit's objectives were to review policies for reasonableness, document the approval process, test equity across departments, review the tax calculation process, and evaluate the risk of fraud, waste, and abuse in this space. The audit, <clears throat> this audit reports on eight unique findings. A finding is noted when audit identifies an area of non-compliance with documented policies or policies that are in place that are outside of best practices. Simply put, findings identify areas of risk. Of the approximately 750 city-owned vehicles, take-home vehicles are utilized by seven city departments that you see up here on your slide. The distribution of those 199 take-home vehicles is represented here in this chart. The audit findings are listed here, uh, one through seven, lack of documented policies and procedures, fleet management review and approval, the attestation forms, business purpose for take-home vehicles, number five, unnecessary fuel costs, city carrying risk unnecessarily, and the use of telematics. These were responded to by the city manager's office as this is a citywide program. And I wanted to unpack this number seven just a little bit, the use of telematics, as that is an, sometimes an unfamiliar term. Telematics is a method of monitoring cars, trucks, and equipment and other assets by using GPS technology and onboard diagnostics. Um, telematics is considered an essential management tool for many commercial and government fleets. The top five benefits of telematics include reducing fuel costs, cost-effective maintenance, better communication, 
enhancing safety and resource management. Our audit report states the city currently uses telematics sparsely throughout the fleet inventory. This amounts to 35 vehicles with GPS used by the maintenance and operations team and GPS that's in use in our RPD vehicles and some are outfitted with the Axon Fleet camera system. Heading back to the remaining audit findings, uh, number eight, RPD policies and procedures, number nine, mileage restriction for fleet in RPD, and number 10, a mileage restriction for the regional crime suppression unit. These last two were originally reported by the Center for Public Safety Management, often referred to as CPSM, in their January 2022 report titled Police Operations and Data Analysis Report. CPSM is considered a subject matter expert in local government safety services. And RPD is the responding um, group for these three findings. So I wanted to provide a few more details to best communicate the impact of the current pra practices. And this analysis is for RPD vehicles specifically, since CPSM did recommend a mileage limit in the report and that department does have most of the city's take home vehicles. So we have RPD headquarters here in the middle on 2nd Street. This circle encompasses most of the commuting RPD employees living in Reno, Sparks, and Verdi. As we zoom out, this map extends to include home addresses in Washoe Valley and Carson City for commuting employees. And zooming out a bit more, this image shows the distance of some of the outliers, RPD employees with home addresses well outside of the city of Reno. Of the 160 RPD take-home vehicles with a physical home address on file, 12 are commuting more than 30 miles from RPD headquarters. The fuel cost to the city is approximately $32,000 per year. Other costs include vehicle wear and tear and the risks associated with commuting, which are detailed in the report. While this is a small percentage of cost compared to the annual budget, it may also be an unnecessary cost to the city. The corrective action plans for the findings are included as an appendix to the audit report uh, beginning on page eight, and they include the management responses identified by the city manager's office for findings one through seven and for, by RPD for the remaining three findings. That concludes my summary reporting on the audit report. And as a reminder, the internal audit division here at the city is here to provide the city of Reno with an independent appraisal function designed to assist Reno City Council, constituents, and management in establishing accountability, transparency, and a culture of continuous improvement in city operations. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, I am going to, I have a few questions myself. I feel that I just heard your report, but I don't have a really good sense of your findings. Um, I know that you found some findings and that you have recommendations, mm -hmm. but I really don't understand very well what those are. And I am a little bit concerned um, about two things. One is the, the telematics. So that's basically GPS wayfinding so that we know where the car is at all times, essentially. Telematics is a, a breadth of things, which does include that, yes. Okay. And then the other question is, you said we have a number of vehicles going more than 30 miles outside of Reno or outside of downtown Reno, uh, or outside of the police station in this case. And my question there is, are they on work when they're commuting? Are they considered on work? And if they get in an accident, is that a work-related accident? I would surmise it's case dependent of the 160 vehicles. Um, some may have the vehicle as a matter of function of their business purpose, i.e. maybe they have a, a canine dog and they, they transport the, the dog in the vehicle so they need the vehicle. Um, some may be undercover, some may be on call, and that would be a question for the department. Okay, well, department. <laughs> so my question, just to recap, I'm just wondering, for the police officers that take home vehicles, are they considered on work time? Like, is that part of their work day? Uh, Assistant Chief Ollie Miller, for the record, and thank you for the question. Yes, they are considered on work time. Okay. So the moment they leave their front door, uh, for the most part, they are in a non-duty status. On duty. Yes. And so if an accident occurs, that's an on-duty accident. That would be on work time. Yes. That the city would be responsible for. Yes. Um, are there any that aren't? So in other words, just people that are taking home vehicles, let's say, for, for some other purpose. Is there anyone? So 
yeah. our employees take their vehicles home for work or business related purposes. Uh, much of those reasons re revolve around city safety, uh, our being able to respond to critical incidents, investigations, major accidents, victim services, et cetera. Okay. All right. So that was the basic question. I'm sure there are other questions. Anyone on this audit? Maybe not. Okay, good. Um, so I'll ask one more question. It's more generic, not really about RPD. So I'll ask our auditor to come back. So you made the statement that it's unnecessary or unexpected cost to the city. Is it, have you recommended a way to reduce those 30, 32,000 in costs is what I recall you presented? So this is um, an exercise where similar to cleaning out a well-worn backpack, every time and again you need to take everything out, see what's inside, and decide what to put back in. So this gives us an opportunity for, for management to decide where we want those um, those lines to lie, and if we want an attestation form, for example, which is currently in our policy, um, have someone who's de designated to take ownership of that program. So over time, policies get forgotten sometimes, people move jobs, um, so this was one of the things, for example, one of the findings that we just haven't been following our own policies. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, do we want to change the policy or do we want to comply with what's already been documented. And who would be, I mean, is that Mr. Manager? Is that our police chief for one example? But there's others, public works uh, director, ma operations and maintenance director. Is it up to them individually or is it centralized to our manager or? My understanding of how um, jurisdictions generally do this is there is a citywide policy for all city, whereas the police department does have kind of a subsect because they operate differently. Okay. And then speaking of the police department, you mentioned the, the report that was done um, and that we weren't in compliance is what I thought I heard you say. Could that report was um, informational in nature. There were 170 recommendations. My understanding is the department has been working through those recommendations, um, but it's not... Um, you know, similar to my follow-up that I come back in six months, there's not a process for that type of No report. process for follow-up. They've made their recommendations. And then um, maybe this is a question for our, um, and I don't know your current title now. Uh, assistant chief. Assistant chief. Uh, assistant chief. <laughs> You've had many titles since I've known you. Um, congratulations on that. But is, tell us just is the um, you and our police chief working through those recommendations still or is that considered stale at this point? Assistant Chief Ollie Miller for the record. Yes, we are working through all the recommendations of the CPSM audit and I think it's part of the packet our chief of police Catherine Nance has committed to uh, updating a creating a policy built on city policy for our own internal take-home vehicle policy. So okay. she's got that letter in there and she's got me diligently working on it as we speak. Okay, good to know. Um, Mr. Manager, any comments on this audit yourself? Since this is really lands in your feet, I suppose. No, I think I, I, I think I speak for all of us on the 15th floor when I say I'm excited to see what Assistant Chief Miller and Chief Nance come up with, um, their commitment to, to, you know, writing this program in, in its scope is, mm -hmm. is commendable and, and overdue. So thank you very well, much. Well, it Chief. sounds like about half maybe of the vehicles are not within the police department but are elsewhere. That's true, but I think the, uh, the most pointed space that, that we're focused on is, is there at the police department, and so we're going we're gonna to focus there first, and okay. we'll get after the rest of them after that. All right. Any more follow-up follow questions or comments? All right. Seeing that you do have something, Mr. Martinez? Oh, okay. You ready to make a motion, perhaps, to accept the report? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I move to accept the internal audit division report. I'll take home vehicles. All right. Second. All right. So we have a motion from Mr. Martinez, second from Mr. Reese. Um, any final comments or questions on this motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, good work, Madam Auditor. Thank you. We really appreciate what you do for us. We're going to move on to item uh, G1. And that is actually my neighborhood advisory board. I've had a change. Someone I appointed last meeting has withdrawn uh, due to some conflicts. And uh, that sort of uh, skewed my thought process here. So I'm going to hold this off. Uh, I wouldn't mind just holding it to the next meeting versus the first meeting of, is that possible? OK, thank you. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask to um, defer item G1. 
And we're moving to item G2, and I do have some recommendations on this one. Um, on this one, I'd like to recommend, uh, this is for the Historic Resources Commission, and I would like to recommend the reappointment of Deborah Campbell, our licensed structural engineer. This is a reappointment. Uh, Greg Ernie, who is our registered state architect reappointment. And then finally, uh, Kathy Bryant. I had an opportunity to interview her at length. She seems like a good addition. Second. Okay. All right, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. All right, motion passes unanimously. All right, we are then on to item H1, which is about city council comments, announcements, boards and commissions, anything for the good of the order from any of the groups you're on. I know we cover together some 45, I'm gonna say, boards and commissions. So there's a, there potentially is a lot to talk about. Anyone? Ms. I have a comment. Yeah, Miss Ebert. So we had our first, um, a senior cooking class at the Elks Club on the uh, February 29th, and I just want to say it was a really great success. Um, we had a lot of fun. A lot of people showed up. So we're looking to have more of these events uh, going forward, just trying to figure out the scheduling and how we're going to work it out. So more to come on that. But it was just really uh, a fun event. I had a lot of feedback from the seniors that attended, um, you know, that they had a really great time and people saying that they wanted to come to the next one. So just um, working on how to make that happen. So just wanted to share that. That it sounded really exciting. Yeah, it, it was, was a, a great really time. cool idea. Yeah, it was. Yeah, so. really good. I heard from Chef Chapin. He had a really good time yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. He's a great guy and um, a good friend. And he said it was very well received. Yeah, very well received. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Anyone else uh, comments for the good of the order? Mr. Martinez. Thanks so much, Madam Vice Mayor. Just uh, quickly, I think all, at this point, all of us have heard about um, the processing center on Vassar Street. Um, and now I am not asking the body for a resolution or a memo, but just bringing that up to the attention and the impacts that it will have, not just to small businesses, but all of us who use those services um, and considering doing some advocacy work on our own end. So I just wanted to highlight that point that we're all going to deal with and feel the impacts of here recently or here um, quickly. I'm really glad you brought that up. I, I may have dreamed it, but I think I wrote in a request for that actually to appear on an agenda. And uh, I thought we should take a formal position. I sent a letter to the Postmaster General last week asking for a presentation from the Postal Service on to the us. matter to you at a meeting to be determined in the future. So. I'll keep you in the loop as it relates to any correspondence Do you know we receive anything about the timing that they're planning? I don't know that they're planning on any timing. That's why we sent the letter. So we'll okay. see what we get back from them. What I mean is to make their decision. You don't know that either. I don't. I do know that Congressman Amaday um, asked that no action be taken until 2025 at the earliest. Um, I saw that correspondence last week or the week before. Um, but I, don't, I do not know what the position of the Postal Service okay. is. All right, great. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. I concur. Thank you. Um, anyone else for the good of the order? All right. Well, seeing none, um, I want to alert the group that we do have a 6 p.m. appeal. We're going to break for lunch, and we're going to come back for the item. Um, let's see. Oh, calling in? Oh. Well, could you alert me, Madam Clerk? Do we not on yet? Oh, okay. Well, why don't we just pause for a couple moments. It looks like the mayor's going to join, and maybe we can take this last item before lunch. That would be great. So we're just standing in recess for five minutes.
Oh. We're ready. Mayor is on here. Yeah, I know. Okay. All right. All right, we are going to bring the meeting back to order. Thanks for your patience. Um, we do, uh, Madam Clerk, can you confirm the mayor has joined us by um, phone? Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. We do have Mayor Shivi on the line, and we've already tested sound with her, so we are good to go. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to move to item D2 under Public Works, which is presentation, discussion, and direction to staff for approval of the Regional Transportation Commission FY 2025 Interlocal Cooperative Agreement authorizing the RTC program of projects. And when our team, um, when you come up, will you distinguish, we vote on several things for RTC throughout the year, the POP, program of projects. Can you distinguish that from the other things we vote on? Okay. Would you join us? And... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, shall we take some, do we have any public com comment, Madam Clerk? Thank you. We do have public comment um, on item D2, Tom Albright. Okay, great. Mr. Albright. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think it's still morning. Um, yes. I'm uh, Dr. Tom Albright. I'm here to speak in support of the staff recommendations for the roadway projects listed under item D2. I speak as a Reno resident, a parent, um, the brother of a victim of a traffic fatality, uh, an active transportation and sustainability researcher, and as the president of the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance. Uh, right now, Nevada is experiencing a public health crisis on our roads. As of the end of February, uh, our state has experienced 58 roadway deaths, and we're on pace to break records that have stood for decades. Uh, nearly half of these deaths have been pedestrians. Um, and the burden is not shared evenly. This falls much more heavily on lower income folks. Um, black and Latino people face approximately two times the risk per mile walked or ridden as their white counterparts. So um, one of many solutions that we should con consider is addressed by some of these projects. Uh, I'm gonna cite protected bicycle infrastructure that's included in many of these projects. It's been shown to drastically reduce roadway fatalities, not only for folks on bikes, but also for the pedestrians and, uh, as dri and drivers as well. Um, and after sort of a gloomy start to my little spiel, I also wanna talk about some fun stuff that these uh, bikeways are a great way to get a lot of people, approximately half the population, says that they'd be interested in riding their bike more if they felt more comfortable. And surveys show that approximately 85% of people uh, in this category say specifically that protected bike lanes would help them feel more comfortable and, and get them on their bikes more often. And this is a really great way we can increase the activity of our citizens, increase economic activity in downtown and, and adjacent areas as people on bikes uh, are more likely to stop. It's a stickier process when you're riding through rather than when you're driving through. Um, and so I would just urge everyone to support this uh, recommendations and uh, thank you for your work on this matter. All right. Uh, doctor, let me just express my condolences for the loss of your brother. And it sounds like it was on an accident in the street or driving or biking. Um, I'm so sorry. And I'm sure the whole council shares my concern. Um, and I, but I appreciate your advocacy and taking the time to be here. Um, we, this council has dealt with uh, pedestrian, in particular, deaths for a long time. Um, we have tried to adopt um, zero fatalities uh, program. Um, I thought we were doing a better job, but it sounds like there's still a lot of challenges ahead. Um, I also just want to mention that myself and Carrie Williams, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Carrie Kosky, have worked very, um, very much on school-related infrastructure projects. Uh, we keep spending a lot of money and wondering why schools haven't done more themselves through school budgets, but then we're coming in sort of after the fact trying to clean up. And um, Carrie has assured me that she's looking at or is changing our operation manual, our construction manuals to require those kind of things up front. So thanks for your advocacy and being here. Lots of work to do, okay. thank you. Yeah. All right, who is up from our? We also have Dora Martinez via oh. Zoom. Okay, all right. Ms. Martinez, uh, I don't see you yet on our screens, but. Uh, Are you able to hear me? I can hear you. 
Oh, good morning. It's Dora Martinez. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I also want to um, ditto Mr. Albright, Dr. Albright's um, concern and also just put it on the map and in your forefront, the, um, the Americans with Disability Act. I know the RTC has been working um, with us very well. Sorry, my computer is saying the host would like me to speak, but I think you can hear me fine. So um, I appreciate everything that you all do, especially this um, this council. Um, Madam Doer, you, you, your council and the mayor has been absolutely marvelous. Um, we feel so heard when we come with our concerns as people with disability, and we just want to give our hats to you and thank you and make it a great day. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Ms. Martinez for participating today. Yep. All right. Do we now have a staff or is there more? Madam Clerk? We do not have additional public comment. Just for the record, we did receive one letter of concern correspondence, which has been distributed to council and is a part of the record. All right. Mr. Wilson? Well, uh, good afternoon or noon, uh, Council, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Council Members. Um, I am Khalil Wilson. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Works here for the City of Reno. I'm very pleased to present this item today where we could be seeking approval of the RTC Fiscal Year 2025 Interlocal Cooperative Agreement so these identified projects can advance the design and construction. With me here today is Mr. Dale Keller, Director of Engineering from the Re Regional Transportation Commission. So we put this graphic together to help visualize how projects move through the RTC's planning and project implementation process. Uh, the Regional Transportation Plan, or RTP, is the central component of RTP's planning process. The purpose of the RTP is to identify the needs and goals of the Regional Transportation Region system over the 20-year horizon, planning horizon. Prior to the adoption of this current RTP, RTC requested input from Reno's priorities at the February 12, 2020 uh, council meeting. Reno staff worked with RTC to include these council identified priorities with returning to City Council on January 27th, 2021 to provide an update and included responses to City Council's recommendation and priorities. The RTT was, the, the 2050 RTP was ad adopted by RTC on March of 2021. As you progress from the 20 year outlook in the RTP, projects move from there into uh, five-year project horizon and programmed in the Regional Transportation Improvement Pl Program where funding is identified. The five-year RTP was also approved on March of 2021 with the 2050 RTP. Projects that move closer to implementation from the five-year RTIP horizon and, a, and approval of the annual Interlocal Cooperative Agreements or ICAs. Each agency, Washoe County, Sparks, and Reno, approves the ICA with the RTC to implement the regional projects within their own jurisdiction. As you may remember, we received a memo a couple weeks ago that discussed all the ICAs that we've approved over the past four years. This brings us here today, where we're looking at next year's ICA, so these exciting projects in Reno can move to construction, design and construction. So what does this interlocal agreement do? So the agreement between RTC and the city of Reno, it identifies a program of projects to advance the design and construction. It gives authorization to the RTC to design and construct projects on behalf of the city, which will include eminent domain if needed. And it specifies the responsibilities for delivery of the identified projects. So what's included in our 25, 2025 ICA? So first is the pavement preservation program. This year's budget of $22.5 million, the goals of projects within this category is to keep the regional roads in good condition. This category includes preventative maintenance projects such as surface treatments and roadway rehabilitation. The second category in the middle is Traffic Intelligent Transportation Systems, or ITS. RTC allocates roughly $10 million annually to this category and includes intersection operations and safety projects such as signal, uh, traffic signal upgrades and new traffic signals. The last category is our roadway projects. Under this year's ICA, RTC has identified and programmed $90.5 million for roadway projects in Reno, and I'll go into those in a little more detail in the next few slides. 
capacity and circulation. RTC is investing 20 million and continue to expand the roadway capacity and improve traffic circulation in North Valleys. The Moya Boulevard widening project will widen Moya from two lanes to four lanes between Red Rock Road and Lear Boulevard. This project will improve intersection operations and provide continuous pedestrian and multimodal facilities. The design is scheduled to begin in 2025 and construction in 2027. RTC is investing approximately 70 million towards road safety and micromobility projects. You can see here on the map, on the left there is the West 4th Street Safety Project. In the middle is the 6th Street for All. And on the, on the right hand side inside the box is the Downtown Micromobility Network of Projects. 6th Street for All. This $24 million project includes $9 million of federal funding from Safe Streets for All grant, or SS4A grant, that RTC was awarded this past December. This project will focus on safety for all roadway users at intersections and along 6th Street corridor between Virginia and 4th Street. Project will, design will begin in 2025 and estimated construction in 2026. Continuing on the theme of safety, RTC is moving forward with West 4th Street Safety Project from West McCarran Boulevard to Keystone Avenue. RTC anticipates spending around $27 million for this project. That'll, that includes 13 million of federal funding. The project will include pedestrian connectivity, a separated shared use path, and roundabouts at Stoker, and seen here on the right here at Summit Ridge. Project is, is scheduled to be complete design in 2024 and estimated to begin construction in 2025. Downtown Reno Micromobility Project. This council has been very supportive of micromobility in RTC and over the over the, the past couple years. And RTC is planning on spending $20 million on the downtown Reno Micromobility Street Network. As you may recall, in October of this past year, council approved the downtown micromobility network of streets and requested RTC to include these streets in the regional transportation plan. These streets are highlighted on this map in pink. Uh, they are 5th Street from Keystone to Evans. This will connect shopping and restaurants from Keystone to the 4th Street Brewery District. Vine Street from Riverside Drive to University Terrace connects the neighborhoods north of, the, north of I-80 to the Truckee River. Virginia Street, California Avenue to 9th Street supports placemaking and connects Midtown to the University. And a combination of Lake Street, St. Clair, and Evans from Holcomb to 9th Street We'll, we'll provide another route from Midtown to the Truckee River, to the RTC's bus station at, on 4th Street, and to the university. Concludes my presentation. There's the recommended motion. I'm here to answer okay. any questions. All right. Great. Looking for questions. I'll call Ms. Taylor first. Thank you, Madam Vice, Sir. Vice Mayor. Thank you for being here. I'm super excited about a lot of these things. I want to ask a quick question on the roadway re re rehabilitation. If you might just talk a little bit about what the criteria is and the reason why it looks like we have $11.7 million that we're going to be investing. A lot of the projects fall within Ward 2. So I would like for us, if you could just explain how those are prioritized. It's not, I don't think it's by ward. I think there are some other criteria that yeah. No, you're absolutely correct. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, pr project, uh, projects are prioritized by um, um, ADT, average daily traffic, and by condition. So whatever the condition of the roadway is on our, on our network, we keep track of the, what the condition is. As condition falls and the ADT is, is high, those get um, elevated to the, to the top priority. Okay, perfect. And then I think the other question, or not necessarily a question, on the 4th Street project, um, the roadway project, very exciting because we can see, I'm a super geek when it comes to roadway and transportation and traffic, but the investment that we have seen in other corridors in the transportation and the street network has transformed regions. So if we look at what RTC is thinking about doing on 4th Street from McCarran to Vine in that Stoker area with the roundabout, I'm just really excited about the things that can happen in that area and then the revitalization that comes after it. Again, with the connectivity with the other project um, on 6th Street and 4th Street. So super excited. It looks like in 24 and 25, based on last um, ICA, there's a lot of construction going on and then it sort of tapers back in, 20, in 26 and 27. But with these projects that we're seeing, 
that should ramp up again once we get through the engineering and the environmental process? 100%, yes, correct. Okay, thank you so correct. much. Okay. Uh, looks like Mr. Reese. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, for my part, Mr. Wilson, I want to thank you and your team and also Mr. Keller and his team at the RTC because I think about where we have been um, for the last, uh, we'll just say five years, and I know that um, it has been uh, the work of community groups like Trucking Matters Bicycle Alliance. It's been the work of Ms. Koski and you, Mr. Wilson, um, really uh, making the laboring or and I know it can be tiring to have me bugging you all the time about why aren't we doing this faster sooner but we got there together right so for my part the downtown regional micro mobility project uh, when we did the test project a couple summers ago now it really started to give the momentum to what we could do and what we dream about. And so I think there's a lot to be excited for. Um, obviously, a $70 million, a little more than $70 million investment in micromobility in this region is going to be something that is legacy defining, I think, for us. What will be incumbent upon all of us, of course, is to keep pushing, right, to look for innovative solutions. It's There's probably not a day that doesn't go by that I don't get some constituent who reaches out with a new design idea a new configuration of a street, a better roundabout, you know, building the better mousetrap. And we have to, I think, as policy makers on this body, we have to think very broadly about the region and all of the ways in which connectivity impacts all of us. But we have to not stand in our own way, right? And so where there is innovation to happen, I think that's important. This morning, someone tagged me on social media about making sure our connectivity uh, markers were red rather than green. And I'm not a traffic engineer. I don't know the importance of making roadway markings red rather than green, but someone does, right? I don't know if that's the Dutch Cycling Embassy, our friends at the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance, who have uh, worked very hard to um, be as gracious supporters that they can. There have been times where we have been at a little bit of a impasse, but I feel like we have uh, included and move forward together in a way that's very meaningful for our community. And I really do thank them for that because uh, again, um, as policymakers, we see it at a different level and, and have to stand back and look at it. I won't be able to make all the choices that I want to see happen, but this is one that I'm inc incredibly proud of, all the work that's gone into it. And I I know it was a, a laboring process. It did take time um, and, of course, resources. So uh, I also get to see this at the RTC side, so we get to see it in two passes. I, I'm also excited because even in this iteration, there are, um, I think, future projects jumping off. I know that uh, Councilmember Ebert and I are talking about extensions of bicycle facilities into North Valleys, and there are different projects that are being scoped right now that will lead to, I think, improvements there all for the service of our community. So it's it's great, great work. Good job to the teams. All right. Thank you. And then let me ask, um, Madam Mayor, are you on? Did you have any comments? Yay. Oh, you're here? Oh, thought you were still on. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'll make a comment. Um, thank you. Welcome. Hello. Uh, welcome. So I'll make a comment. Um, first of all, I'd love to see these things rolling out. Um, I do have a comment. So there's a project with RTC, and I guess I'll call it Mr. Uh, Dale here, on Steamboat Parkway. So I just wondered, is that supposed to start now? <laughs> it was supposed to start spring? Yep, good afternoon. Dale Keller, Director of Engineering at the RTC. Uh, Councilman Madure, uh, yes. We are going to begin construction in April for the April. Steamboat Project from Amazing. Damani Ranch overall to Veterans Parkway. Okay, long awaited. I'm so glad to hear it. Uh, the other one was Veterans Roundabout. I don't know if that's even on a list. Council Member, yes, it is on the list. Uh, we are right now under final design. We're coordinating closely with the Nevada Department of Transportation who owns that portion of that roadway at the Veterans Roundabout, make modifications to address some of the congestion that we see both in the morning and, and in the afternoon. Well, I know our own staff took a hard look at it and we're looking at even things like the signage that's associated with it didn't comply with um, you know, the US highway standards, um, the type of signs, the height of the signs, the distance back from the roundabout, all the things, uh, the striping on the road, you know, is is there going to be, is it going to be constructed more like the roundabout on Neal Road, where you have uh, sort of segregated lanes coming in? 
I would say both those roundabouts and first off, city staff has been great to work with and bring those issues forward, yeah. about signages and striping. Um, they both serve different purposes, yeah. the Neal Road roundabout as well as the Veterans roundabout. So as we looked into the solutions, we found some very unique ways where we can modify and help the traffic flow as need be. If you're coming down from Geiger Grade, or if you're coming from uh, North Virginia, or excuse me, South Virginia Street to get through that roundabout. Do you know offhand, I know that historically the Neal Road roundabout was like 60,000 cars a day. It's probably more today because that's an old number. I don't know what the veterans one is. Do you have any idea how much traffic goes through there? I do not have those numbers okay. offhand. I can get it to you. Okay. And then finally, related to that, you were going to be building a road, I thought, with a bridge over Steamboat Parkway to divert some of the traffic off of that roundabout. Is that still on the plan? Yes, we are looking at to the Geiger grade realignment or the toll road realignment. Um, there's some things we need to consider through environmental process um, between the Butt Week and the Steamboat Creek. So there's a lot of different issues that we're looking to investigate first before we move forward through a final design. But that'll come later after Veterans Roundabout? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I didn't realize. I thought that was coming before Veterans Roundabout. So we're, the, the thought process was at the RTC, we can do some of these quick improvements at the roundabout existing before the greater long term uh, solutions you. needed for okay. this new road. All right. Uh, Madam Mayor, did you have some things to add? I do. I just um, <clears throat> want to make sure council Might weighs in. Put this on green. I just want to make sure council weighs in um, before I do, since I walked in. Oh, well, um, Council Member Ebert. Hi, I have Hi. some questions. Um, I, I noticed in your presentation, I think it was on um, maybe slide four, can, if we can go back to that. So the last picture, that looks like it's the Lemon Drive on-ramp and off-ramp interchange there. Is that an RTC project? I thought that was an NDOT. It was, our, our, it was NDOT. So good afternoon, Councilmember Ebert, Dale Keller, Director of Engineering at the RTC for the record. So NDOT, uh, RTC partnered with NDOT for these improvements. So NDOT gave RTC roughly about $10 million to construct the interchange on their behalf. Okay. And we incorporate that part of the Lemon Drive widening project from Buck Drive, Sky Vista, all the way out to Military Road. Okay. So we did it as one construction project. Okay, thank you, because I was a little confused on that. Um, another question I have, um, I know that we're going to be working on Military Road, and forgive me, can you remind me when the widening of Military Road is going to happen? Uh, yes, ma'am. So uh, we're having actually a, a public meeting. We're anticipating at the end of April to talk about what that preferred alternative would look like and get public input um, to that solution, working with city staff to making sure um, we're still addressing the needs out there. So we're going to finalize the design this year. Okay. And then look to go to construction in 2025. Okay. All right. Any other council members? Council well, Member Reese? Uh, actually, I wanted I, to... I wasn't done. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. You said so, okay. So. Um, yeah, I was just writing a note. So um, I did want to mention that um, Council Member Reese and I were talking about um, having a protected bike lane um, going um, North Virginia from um, Panther to connecting to the North Valley. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate that that's going to be, uh, you know, priority for me. I have um, constituent feedback on that, that there's a, a desire for that. So I just want to make sure that that I, I make that comment publicly to put that on the record, um, that we include that in the plans, um, that that is a, a priority for me. I know I see comments on social media and things like that where um, sometimes I take some heat for um, people thinking I don't support micromobility and bike lanes. I just want to let people know that I do. Um, I do also consider um, cars because we get a lot of funding for our roads through the gas tax. So I also consider um, you know other forms of vehicles um, and uh, considering most of the people in the North Valleys do drive cars. But um, I also want to just share that I am very concerned about um, micromobility lanes as well. So I'm just going to wanted to state that. All right, Mr. Reese. Well, I wanted to build on something um, Councilmember Ebert mentioned, and that is this roadway project here on slide four, um, because I do think it points out an important part of the changed landscape between NDOT and our local partner, RTC, and the communities. So I don't know if, Mr. Keller, you want to speak to that, but it used to be that you know NDOT funded NDOT projects, and that was really what was the lane. It has now been the case on at least two projects, including this one and the Spaghetti Bowl, that there the state is really looking for uh, some commitment locally, financially, and otherwise to do projects. So it's one of those 
those things where we're having to balance that competing concern, which is that the state should pay for and do its thing, but to make the projects happen and to get them further along or into the, the line at the, we'll call it the suite of things that could be done, we have committed dollars at the RTC to make it happen. And so I think that's important just for everyone's head knowledge to understand that it's not the old way, which is just NDOT does their things and just RTC does their things. We've had to cooperate and collaborate with them to make the dollars stretch further. Council okay. Member, very good point. Uh, one thing I would like to say, the state has a lot of needs around the, around the state. In Southern Nevada, here in Reno, and out in Elko. So part of the strategy is make that decision hard and difficult to where they spend the money. So we found if we can invest some money up front to either move forward the design or environmental, it puts us in a better position to be competitive, not only for formula dollars that come through NDOT directly, but also discretionary grant dollars. I think a lot of the improvements that you're seeing in the North Valleys right now is because the initiative that the RTC board took forward said go do, and then now is really having some federal dollars, a $100 million grant opportunity for the next phase of US 395 North Valleys widening. So th that strategy is working, and that's why we're finding ways we can collaborate and work together with the state. Okay. The other thing I'll add is, as Councilmember Ebert is right, um, that, uh, well, I'm actually, I'm not sure if she's right. I don't know who's going after you online saying you don't support micromobility. You've always been advocating for micromobility in the North Valleys, meaning when you're always following along the projects that are going on. And of course, our role as people, because I sit on the RTC, is then to take that into the RTC and advocate for that on behalf of the folks in the North Valleys and Councilmember Ebert. So I think it is a, a strange thing. I would just say, you know, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Uh, it's certainly not true for most of what is said there. I know that you're advocating for safety improvements across the entirety of the North Valley. So good job. Uh, Mr. Kelleher, before we go to the mayor, um, I wanted to say that most of these are very long-awaited projects. So we're, including Steamboat, which is not on your list, right? I think it suffered maybe a one and a half or two year delay. Um, I think for all the projects, it would be good for you to consider doing some kind of uh, groundbreaking, uh, whether it's ones that are on, on the list or not, are still yet to come. Uh, for example, it's a good way to let our residents know it's finally here, you know, in a very positive way, not when they just see the orange cones and suddenly they can't drive through Steamboat or around Veterans or whatever. But I would encourage you to reach out to any of the council members uh, for projects in their ward and to look at ways that we can increase visibility of your work um, for our residents who will be delighted. You know, they may be grumpy about the, you know, temporary congestion and challenges, but they're going to be very happy to see these projects move. Would you consider that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, very good point. We need to do a better job of highlighting some of the achievements that we're reaching and and show the great work that we're doing. So, yes, well, we'll I'll give you an, an example happening right now, which I was going to ask you offline. has nothing to do with this item, but it is an RTC item, which is that you gave a grant to the city uh, to begin sidewalk installation along Plumas and along Urban. It's underway. I think that that would be a great thing to celebrate. You know, that was co-sponsored by... Um, Council, uh, sorry, Commissioner Hill and myself and um, our residents are probably scratching their heads going, what's going on? I have heard it. What's going on there? So anyway, I think that whatever you do gets notice and that we should, you know, put that out to the public in a good way. Thank okay. You. Over to you, Madam Mayor. All right. Thank you so much. Dale, thank you so much for being here. I think you should just stay there all day. <laughs> um, quick question, um, cause I, and I so apologize that I walked in a little bit late to see all your slides, so I, this might be redundant, um, and you might have included it. Let's talk about lighting um, and how much of an investment um, you're making into lighting on some of these projects, because I think we also forget with micro-mobility micro that lighting is also essential. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So yeah, so when when these projects come forward, especially with the micro mobility, uh, it's, it's certainly intersection lighting, and then you know uh, continuous corridor lighting is taken a look at as well to see how those safe those safety measures would uh, would Im would improve for safety. Okay, and whose responsibility is that? Responsibility for on, on the lighting aspect for, for installation. Uh -huh. The installation would be a, a, a part Bless of the project, um, and then uh, it if it's uh, installed. Throughout the corridor, it goes on to our NV Energy's lighting system, and the city of Reno pays for those lighting bills. Mm -hmm. 
And, but I thought RTC puts in the lights. They do install them, that's correct. Okay, so I'd love to see what that plan looks like for lighting, because I notice oftentimes it seems like we're really well lit, and then off, oftentimes it goes really dark, and I don't understand how we decide sort of the lighting patterns throughout. So do you have a plan? Like, talk a little bit about that, because it seems like we don't really think about that aspect of it. So, because I know you guys yeah. love roads, <laughs> but also I think the lighting is really important. So not going into any too granular detail, but you know, with lighting, when you're lighting a corridor, you know, it not always too much light can almost be a bad thing. So there's what's called uniformity ratio of how the light balances between the roadway and the and the and the path. And we do have standards in our in our design manuals that kind of speak to the uniformity ratio. Okay. Um, and then Dale, let's talk about and, you know, this has always been sort of like one minute we're doing this, one minute we're doing that. Let's talk a little bit about the downtown bike lanes. So first of all, put on the record exactly um, what you, you think the best recommendation is because, you know, there's been a lot of talk of like, this isn't the best. This is, you know, it, it's been a whole controversial, I guess, subject. So talk a little bit about why you think this is the, the best path. Mayor Reese, Dale Keller, Director of Engineering at the RTC. Uh, Mayor Reese, wow, I'm sorry, you got a promotion. Very <laughs> shady. Um, it's all right, we yeah. know who you meant. <laughs> uh, I, I think at the, end of the, at the end of the day, there's a lot of great things that we went through that process for call it transportation planning. What does the future of downtown Reno look like? And the action taken by this city council back in last October, and as well as by the RTC uh, commission, to get us to this point today, we're really there landing the plane to really move forward on environmental and final design. So as Mr. Wilson said, we're looking to finalize the design this year, begin some work in 2025, and really transform how downtown looks. And these corridors that are shown in pink and the one in a kind of dark red there on, on Fifth Street, those are different things that's it's really gonna transform the way um, how downtown looks and feels. I'm excited about it. I know city staff is excited about it. And it's $70 million worth of investment. Okay. That and it sounds huge. like um, that uh, Truckee Meadows Bike Alliance is also in support. Is that correct? Okay. Um, yes. Tom just came up and, and spoke and done public comment and, and talked to from what uh, him as an individual stands for. We've been meeting uh, regularly with Timba. And this, as we begin the design process of what this will look and feel like, as we have more details, we'll continue to engage with uh, Timba as well as the public on what the final yeah. design will I look like. I think that's really critical. Thank you so much for doing that because they, um, I think, know it so much better than we do. They do a lot of writing along those paths. I, I look at them as experts. Um, you know, they're always pointing out things that they think are unsafe or that are really good that we should repeat. So I really, really appreciate that. And then just on the record, because it looks really small over here. So it's um, Virginia Street, correct? I think it's in pink. Yeah, yeah Virginia, it's all in, uh, the ones that we're, we're moving forward with are in pink, correct? Okay, so it's Fifth Street, my eyes uh, are Bine, really Bine, Fifth Street, Bine, Virginia Street. Yeah, and then uh, St. Lake. Clair, Lake, Evans as a combination. Okay, and when will we start that? So design's gonna uh, begin the, this next year and begin construction in 2025. If I can add, yeah. if, if I can add, we have actually a, a design consultant under agreement. We're going to give them an NTP this week, and so we're we're moving right along. So there's no delay. Um, based on action taken today, we'll be able to continue to progress. Okay, and tell me when do you project um, finishing the project? Construction will start in 2025. Uh -huh. uh, we'd look to get that done as quickly as possible, probably one construction season. Hopefully we can complete everything in that calendar year. It might go, make over in 2026, but our goal is right now to get everything done in that 2025. So it sounds like the end of 25. Yes, okay. and, and I like to say this is new infrastructure for the city, and so there's a lot of things we have to work out details. How's it gonna look? How's it gonna be maintained? So there's other key decisions along the way as we go about this. Um, so that's where we're keyed up right now to address those issues now, so as we continue to build this network, we're in unison, it's maintainable and um, okay. constructible. T talk a little bit, maybe a little, like uh, what they will look like. Are they going to be painted green? I think uh, I get a lot of feedback about it's green, I can see it. So um, what does that look like? 
we learned and city staff learned a lot of lessons from the pilot project on Fifth Street and Virginia Street. So we're gonna take what we learned from there. We're gonna then ab address it from a global perspective and uh, see those different types of aspects. Did green paint work? Did the candlesticks work? Did the cool little unique art in front of the Rock Center, did that work out well? So those are things we'll evaluate along the way, ask for some public input um, and go from there. Okay, that would be great. I would just love it whenever you do decide that to come back and make sure so we can all weigh in. If you, you know how that is, we'll just keep chirping. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dale, great job. All right, are there any further comments on this project? Um, if there are not, we're looking for a motion. All right, uh, I'll motion. All right, I Madam second. Mayor. All right, so we have a motion from Madam Mayor, second from Council Member Reese to approve the Regional Transportation Commission 2025 Interlocal Cooperative Agreement. Are there any further comments or questions on the motion? All right, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. All right, motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Yeah, great job um, yeah. to your team, Khalil, Carrie, you. and Dale. Great. Yeah. Good job. Exciting day for Yay, Reno. finally. I know. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> exciting, Good job. exciting day. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, Probably never, right? <laughs> I'm just going to round out this. Um, we have, do, are we going to do our final public comment today, now? I think we should, no. I think, do you guys, well, I is think there we any? should probably Let's just, do everything. There, there isn't have any? have attorney client and be out yeah. of here, and then we'll be back at six. Yeah. Correct? So, yeah, if I may, Madam Mayor, we'll, um, we'll continue this meeting. And Is there anything else we haven't covered? Okay, you're frowning. Um, so we'll continue this meeting. We'll take a break and continue a uh, recess. We'll continue the meeting at 6 p.m.
Uh, good evening, everyone. We are reconvening the uh, meeting of the Reno City Council on March 13th, and uh, we are at our 6 o'clock hearing, which is item I, excuse me, I-1. Um, I believe that we have the mayor and council member Reese online uh, on the Zoom. And... Um, Councilmember Dor or uh, Vice Mayor Dord, just to clarify, we have Councilmember Breckis and Councilmember Reese, oh. but Mayor Sheevy has not rejoined at this time. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, why don't you just go ahead and take roll since we're reconvening, and uh, we've been away. Okay. Okay. Councilmember Breckis. I'm here. Dor. Here. Martinez. Here. Ebert. Here. Taylor. Here. Reese. Here. Sheevy absent at this time. Thank okay. you, Vice Mayor. All right. Thank you. Um, and uh, I will ask the city attorney to read the agenda item. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. This is an appeal of the hearing officer's decision to uphold the approval of the building permits BLD 23-03075 and BLD 23-05279 issued for a fence and retaining wall proposed on the southern property line of a parcel located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Outlook Drive and Belford Road approximately plus or minus 260 feet north of Dolan Way, 2600 Outlook Drive. The site is zoning designation of single family, three units per acre, SF3, and master plan land use designation of single family neighborhood, SF. The appeal was filed by Michael Powell. Council may affirm, reverse, or modify the decision of the hearing officer. All right, thank you, Mr. Attorney. And um, I'm gonna now open the public hearing. Um, Madam Secretary, was proper notice given? Vice Mayor, proper notice was given and no correspondence specific to this item was received. All right. And uh, do any council members have any disclosures? I'll start here in the room. Uh, going down the line, Mr. Martinez, no. Ms. Taylor, no. Uh, welcome, Mr. Thornley. And what about you? No, for Ms. Ebert, nor myself. And how about online? How about you, Ms. Breckis? Yes, I do have a disclosure. Oh. I'm I'm going to disclose that this is in Ward 1, and prior to the filing of this appeal, Mr. Powell reached out to me, uh, like any other constituent, with an issue. I told him that I don't um, have side ex party conversations, um, and you know, but it was not an appeal pending before us, but we did have a conversation. I'll also disclose that today, uh, March 13th, I did make a site visit up to the property and viewed uh, the disputed property line um, boundary um, proposed for the fence and the retaining wall uh, from the street. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then Mr. Reese. Nothing, Madam Vice Mayor. Okay, and Mayor Sheevy, any disclosures? Nope. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, and then before we get into the presentation by staff, I'm going to ask if there's any public comment either in the room, first of all. Madam Clerk? We do have public comment from Carol Reno and Brandon Freeman. Okay. Carol, if you'd like to come up. Carol Reno. I have lived at 2600 Outlook Drive almost 40 years. We moved in December of 84. I have raised um, 11 children there and we've um, had some issues with drainage through the years and we finally figured it was time to take that on and try to alleviate the, the problems of the drainage that we had around the house. And it's been a year, almost a year and a half, I would think, We've been trying to get this handled so that we can get the backyard and the drainage area taken care of. All right, before you leave, Ms. Reno, yes. what was your address, did you say? 2600 Outlook Drive. Okay, so you are um, the, property owner. the property owner that's putting up the fence. Yes. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. And then, is there anyone else, Madam Clerk? Brandon Freeman. Hello, my name is Brandon Freeman, and I'm here to represent Robinson Engineering as a project professional and designer for the project. I'm here to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Okay, and then, um, Mr. Freeman, do you work for Robinson Engineering? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, so you are employed with them. Yes. And you're a PE, is that what you said, no. or? No, project you, professional. What, what was it? Project professional. Project professional, okay. All right, thanks for being here. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, Madam Presiding Officer, in lieu of the mayor, um, I cannot see the speakers when they approach the dais. I've not been able to see any views within chambers. I just like to, um, I don't participate remotely too often. Okay. But I thought that the, that you know, all of us had an opportunity to see the speakers in the chambers. We do. So thanks, yes. for, oh. thanks for bringing that to my attention. Madam Vice Mayor, You're so there. we are aware that there's a camera issue in tech and so, so we're working it out right now. Okay, so we have a, I don't know if you heard that, we have a temporary camera issue and it's being addressed. Normally you would be able to see the speakers. Um, I think it looks like there's a PowerPoint, so most of the time, um, I'll let you know when the cameras get fixed. How about that? Well, okay. okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, and then Madam Clerk, are there any more public comments? We have no additional public comment registered at this time. Okay, and how about online? There are no participants online with their hands raised. Okay, but there are other participants besides our council members? Just checking. No. No, okay, very good. Uh, let me get back to our order then. Um, so now what I'm gonna ask is for a presentation by our staff on this project. Good evening, Madam Vice Hi. Mayor, members of the council. For the record, Mike Raley, planning manager. Uh, the item before you tonight is an appeal of a fence permit and a site improvement permit for improvements located at 2600 Outlook Drive. The appeal is of the hearing officer's decision to uphold the issuance of those permits. Um, to give you an overview of the site, as I mentioned, it's located at 2600 Outlook Drive, which is the southeast corner of Belford Road and Outlook Drive. The property is zoned SF3, as are all surrounding properties. The site is developed with one single family residence, which is oriented towards Outlook Drive, but does include a circular driveway with access to both Belford and Outlook. Um, this site plan here is, is the improvement plans that were submitted and the area that you see on the south side of the parcel highlighted in red is the, the portion of the property that is subject to this appeal. The red line represents a retaining wall, which varies from two feet on the west side to four feet on the east side, and then it's proposed to construct a fence atop that wall. The area that you see in green, which is within the front yard setback, would be four feet in height, transitioning to six feet in height, the area that you see there in orange. These are some photos um, taken just recently. As you can see, there are some fence posts put up. Those would have to be cut down to the height specified in the permit, four feet in the front yard, six feet in the rear. But as you can see, this line here in red represents the fence location as looking kind of head on to the site. This is Mr. Powell's residence to the right. And then this is looking kind of northeast along Outlook Drive of the improvements, the improvement area, I should say. The picture that you're pointing to on the right is that from the person's house or is that from the street? That's from the street. This is Mr. Powell's mailbox. So this is looking, well. Okay. All right. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so standing in front of Mr. Powell's house, looking back towards 2600 Outlook okay. Drive. Okay. So just to give you a little history of how we, how we got here this evening. Well, one second, I'm sorry. That was actually from the appellant's house? Correct. Oh, okay, so not from the Reno house. Right, that's looking towards the Reno house. Oh, that gotcha. That just gives kind of a, a clearer view of, of where the fence will be. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so a permit was, was issued in October to allow for 150 lineal feet of four, four to six foot fence along that southern property line. It was proposed to be a wooden post with fabric, shade fabric in between as the material. Um, that was appealed by Mr. Powell on October 31st of 2023. On November 4th, there was an administrative hearing for that appeal in which was continued to January 9th to allow the city to provide Mr. Powell with some additional information, some additional plans that he had requested. In between that hearing and the, the subsequent hearing, the Reno family did file a second permit to allow for the construction of the retaining wall that's, in, that's also part of this appeal. Both of those appeals were, were heard together on January 9th of this year and were upheld 
by the hearings officer. So the hearing officer cited that they, with the city, that those should be issued. Um, and then Mr. Powell filed this appeal that we're hearing tonight on February 4th, or excuse me, February 5th. So I'd like to go through each of the claims in the appeal, um, and I think then we can be available to answer any questions. Uh, the first item listed in Mr. Powell's appeal is that section 18.04.1404 of the Reno Municipal Code applies to this, which would prevent fill within five feet of a residential property line. Um, the this, this section of code, and it can be confusing for somebody that doesn't use our code all the time, but that applies to our residential adjacency standards. So I have the, the purpose of the residential adjacency standards on that slide, but as you will see, those standards apply when you have a residential use adjacent to a non-residential use. In this case, we have two residential uses with identical zoning adjacent to each other. That section of code simply does not apply in this case. The second claim um, cites a, a different section of RMC, which prohibits fill from being placed within five feet of a residential property line. So if you look at the reference to that Mr. Powell notes, it refers back to section 18.04.1404, which are the residential adjacency standards, which we've determined do not apply. So that all use types that he references is taken out of context, is referring to any non-residential use type. So the residential adjacency standards apply to industrial uses, commercial uses, mixed use. That's what the all use types refer to, not a residential use. So once again, this section of code doesn't apply to this case. The next, the next claim, is that the, the wall and fence proposed for construction would, would block drainage from Mr. Powell's property um, onto the Reno property. Um, Reno Municipal Code prevents properties from draining onto an adjoining parcel without a drainage easement. Right. And there's been no evidence of a drainage easement presented by Mr. Powell that would allow for that condition. So that, that's essentially a non-issue in terms of our reviewing of the permit. Last, or actually second to last, is that the construction of the wall and fence would result in drainage onto Mr. Powell's property from the Reno property. Um, as part of this permit, the applicant did submit a comprehensive grading and drainage plan that was reviewed by our engineering staff and Mike Michelle, engineering manager, is here tonight if you have any specific questions. But it was determined um, that that was not the case, that all the drainage would be routed to the historical point of discharge, which is the last chance ditch. And there is a drainage swale that was proposed as part of the construction to ensure that that occurs. Um, Another claim in the appeal is that there has to be an acknowledgement from the Last Chance Ditch Company that they are aware of the improvements being made and they approve. Uh, that was submitted to the city of Reno, a letter from the Last Chance Ditch Company, an acknowledgement that stating no objections or no concerns to this request. And lastly, um, essentially a claim that the fence will be unattractive or, or ugly. Um, the city of Reno does not regulate fencing materials other than barbed wire or razor wire. So the fact there is some reference that Mr. Powell was not necessarily happy with the shade fabric, we do not regulate that. That's permitted under our code and the way that the fence is measured, and you can see the definition here right from code, is that the fence is measured from the top of the retaining wall to the top of the fence. So there was some Discussion in the appeal related to the height of the fence, it meets our code requirement per our code definitions. So when we look at these, there's very little to, to essentially no discretion in a building permit. It's either it meets the rules or it doesn't, the, the applicant followed the rules or they didn't. Okay. In this case, the applicant has followed all the rules and complies with all of our code standards. Okay, before we go on, can you clarify the status of our cameras, please? Okay. Online, we can see uh, the room. We're seeing the back of the speaker. Okay. And so I'm looking at you on the dais, Madam right. Vice. Okay. They had just all gone out for a minute. So I just wanted to make see if they were still projecting um, out in the world. Um, okay. So is there more? No, that concludes my presentation okay. and staff is available for any all questions. All right. I've got a couple questions and I, I suspect our colleagues will too. Okay. Let me ask procedurally. Uh, the person who is making the appeal, when, when do we want to hear from them? 
right after this, it looks like. Okay. So um, I, I had a question. So in reviewing the report, it did mention a cloth material. But in reviewing these pictures that you just showed, I saw wood fencing. Have they changed the material? No, so the, the, the wood fencing that you see are the wooden posts, and then that material would be essentially hung between those posts. Could you put that picture back up? Yeah. Okay, so at the base, though, there's wooden fencing material. That's an existing fence that's in place today. And they're going to take that down? I believe, and I would actually defer to... Um, Mr. Powell, I believe that fence is located on his parcel. That's his. Oh, parcel. that's your fence. So that would that would remain. Okay, I understand. And this fence is behind that fence. Correct. Okay, and this fence would be completely shade cloth. Is that the idea? That's my understanding. Yes, that, okay. that's the material that. And you're saying that's an allowed material. It is. And then finally, I guess one of the questions I had was, on this height issue. So if you're allowed to build the fence on top of the retaining wall. Uh, that total height can be eight feet, so two foot of retaining wall and six foot of fence. So within the front yard, you're limited to four feet of fence height. So you, you heat, what's being proposed is a two foot retaining wall with a four foot shade cloth fence above that. That would in the front in, in the front yard setback, transitioning to six feet as it moves okay. east to the. Well, backyard. looking at this picture, I don't see any retaining wall. Is this the front? Those posts were put into place uh, prior to the issuance of the permit, which. Oh. has now been legalized through the permitting process. Oh, I see. But those would have to be cut down. Yeah, but um, I mean, where's this rock wall? Let me go to the next slide, or previous slide. Right here. So the rock, the wall is proposed, the line that you see in red, Yeah. that is the proposed wall, so along the southern property line. And then where is Mr. Powell's property relevant to this? Right where my cursor is. This is his parcel to the south. Okay, but it, and it doesn't show his house. Because Correct. it's further but, back. No. There we go. So this, so the fence and the is wall right there. are located here. This is Mr. Powell's home right here. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, that's my questions, except for there was one um, in your first slide or second slide. Could you go to that? Uh, the one where you started explaining about the objections. Okay. Um, I had a question about this. Prohibits fill from being placed within five foot of a residential property line. So are we saying that, um, I thought I read that it was within four feet of the property line. So this, that particular section that's cited. Is not applies, relevant to this. Yeah, it applies to commercial uses. So it's right. not uncommon. So what, what essentially is being created here is a landscape planter bed. Okay. So those are fairly common in residential areas where people will essentially build up a section. Sure. That's what's being proposed. That would not be permitted if this was, a, for example, a commercial center. We would not allow them to okay. build up to the But property. in residential, it can be within five. How, how close to the property it line? It can be kind up of, to the property line. Right and, on the property yes. line? And then it looks like Mr. Powell already has a fence. Is that on the property line? That's, I, it's my understanding that fence is actually on his property. On his property. Okay. All right. And you'll go next. And then let me ask, um, first in the room, are there any uh, questions, follow-up to staff? Mr. Martinez. Just a quick question. Thank you, uh, Mike, for the presentation. And um, I think we uh, discussed this a little bit earlier, but just for the record, can you explain some of the drainage uh, concerns that are have been pr brought up by yeah. the yeah. owner? And if you can maybe talk about what a swale is and how that would help in this case. You bet. Case. So the way this is, this is the plan, and I know it's very hard to read at this scale, and I apologize, but if you, if you were to enlarge this, you'd see right here, there's, this is labeled FL, which is flow line. So the, the drainage will come from, from the properties it does, whoop, and there is a swale that's proposed that will direct the drainage down to the ditch. So it's being directed away from Mr. Powell's property. So the, the, the site is obviously it drops, the overall property drops as you approach the ditch. Um, so the drainage naturally flows this way, but it's been designed to ensure that that drainage flows to its historical point of discharge, which is the last chance ditch, and not across the adjoining property. And that line that's coming directly off of the property line going straight down, what is that? This right yeah. here is an existing sanitary sewer line. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then um, any further questions, Mr. Martinez? Uh, Ms. Taylor, no. Uh, what about you, Ms. Ebert? 
No. How about online? Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Reese. Any questions? No, thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Staff. Okay. Ms. Breckus? Yeah, I do have questions. Okay. Thank you. So question number one is um, on that slide that you just had up, the one with the, um, the submittal, I guess. The site plan? The site plan. That's still up. Can you see that? I can't. But, okay. Um, now can that, you? That there. Okay. I didn't see that in the materials that were uploaded onto the, um, for us, for our deliberations. Where does that come from? Th that's included as an exhibit to the staff reports in the site improvement plan set. Um, what wasn't included there was, is this colored version, which made, makes it a little easier to read at a reduced scale. So the site improvement plan set, um, can you tell me what exhibit that was and materials that we have? Because I only have exhibit B and a vis exhibit C, and they're simply the issuance, as I can tell, of the actual permits. So there are the actually permits that were issued, but they don't seem to have the plan sense, or in other words, the documentation backup that staff used to issue the permit consistent with the code. Were those not included in our materials? It was, that was included as exhibit G, G's and George. Exhibit G, let me, let me see, decision of hearing officer? No, it was approved permit plan set and reports. Where's or that? Because I have Actually, you know what, G. I bet you, I apologize, Councilwoman Brackus, I might have my exhibits out of order in this staff report. Been, Jasmine, do you have that? It's exhibit H. Exhibit H. Okay, hold on a sec, because I'm not seeing Exhibit H. I'm seeing, uh, maybe I've got something, I'm not working on paper, off of paper. Let me, let me see what I got here. Exhibit H, approved site plan, okay. So that is what, let me just bring that up. That's five, five pages, and that is the backup for the you're calling it a minor site improvement permit. Is that synonymous with a grading permit? Yeah, would that, a minor site improvement permit is what would be required for a retaining wall uh, of this size. Well, I'm asking, it says grading plan. So I'm asking if they received, it's clear to me they received a fence permit, but did they also receive a grading permit <laughs> yes, they received a site improvement permit, which would allow for the grading associated with this retaining wall. And where is a site improvement? Is that just a building permit? Or it is, is that a... It, it, is a, it is a building permit. A building permit, okay. And what is this, what is the, um, it's an administrative building permit. Okay, I'll leave it at that for now. I want to understand the scenario. So. They, can, they were getting a fence permit, fence permit, and that was appealed. And while you're in appeal in process, they applied for and were issued another permit that was ne necessary to perfect, if you will, the fence permit? I would not say it was necessary to perfect the fence permit. They since changed their design in terms of this raised planter bed which triggered the additional permit for the wall itself. So you didn't think that at that point, the permit should have been completely issued anew. I mean, why, Why? because it's very irregular to be in a an appeal process and then actually amend <laughs> the subject matter of the appeal. I, I'm very confused by that. Councilwoman Breckus, Chris Pingree, Director of Development Services. The additional, the site permit was including the back retaining wall, which was a rockery wall on the east side of the property. And that is where the grading, the uh, geotech report and everything, everything was included in that permit to encompass the actual elevation changes and the rockery wall construction on the east side of the property. The building permit um, that we are in appeal with here today, that one is including the fence and the retaining wall. The grading and site permit was all inclusive of the entire, all of the elevation changes and the import and export of soils and the rockery retaining wall on the east side of the property that parallels the ditch. And was that appealed then? Yes. The site improvement permit? Yes, both permits were appealed. 
And the I rock did. wall and, gra- and fence are together in the other one? Okay. Yeah. All right, Miss Breckus, um, you're about two minutes over. Um, I appreciate the line of questioning, but let me just check in with uh, the rest of the team here, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, how about Mayor Shivi? Did you have any questions about this? Okay. Hearing none. Uh, All let right. me go back to our uh, table here, uh, Mr. Martinez or Miss Taylor. Okay, Miss Ebert. No. Um, I had a question, and that was uh, related to Mr. Martinez's question about the drainage. I just wanted to make sure, was the new drainage swale, which you didn't really answer his question, I don't think, what a swale is, but, I mean, it's a, 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 what, a hollowed-out area that's going to convey the water to the creek or to the ditch? Essentially a ditch. Okay. So um, was that already on the property, or was that a new addition? That was a new addition with this, I, I should, maybe should say an enhanced addition okay. with this permit. Okay. And then I want to be clear following up something Councilmember Breck has said, which is I don't think that they applied, or you you um, correct me, it didn't sound like when in the reading that they applied for this rock wall permit during the appeal. It sounded like they applied for it during the review of the fence, but I'm not sure. I believe, let me go back to my little timeline here and I can I kind of answer that with more certainty. So that permit was issued, yes, yeah, so they would have applied for that prior to to the uh, the hearing, the initial hearing. So that was no. issued before the October 17th, or as part of October 17th, that, and then no, the appeal came? Wanna... <laughs> Chris Pingree, Director of <laughs> Development Services, for the record. So both of these permits came in. The, the defense permit, the BLD 2303075, was, was applied for at pretty much at the same time, maybe a little bit before, but they were done in parallel due to some previous code enforcement cases of work done without permit. Okay. So that's how we ended up with the, we, the requirement for the site permit application as well as the fence retaining wall um, permit application okay. at the same time. And is the site permit a building permit or is that under... under um these are both building building permits. Okay, I got confused with minor site improvement. That's uh, a, something that's issued by planning staff. Building permit only. Oh, building permit only. Okay, all right. Let me go back to Mr. Reese. Any Thank further? you, Madam Vice Mayor. I don't have questions for Mr. Rayleigh, although I, I appreciate the excellent presentation. I may have questions for uh, Mr. Powell. Okay, and back to you, Ms. Breckus. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let, let me get this straight because your timeline has, leaves a few details off. So the fence permit was issued and it was appealed. And then at some point during the appeal period, you know, from the time the appeal was made, a new permit came on. No, I, now, I don't think that's correct, but maybe Mr. Pingree's coming up to address that. Chris Pingree, Director of Development Services, for the record. So if you look at the, the, um, the, the BLD permit numbers, which is 2303075 and the site permit of 05279, those are within probably a month or two apart. They're very close in nature, so they came in relatively at the same time. Um, as we worked through one, um, the, the site permit, the BLD's uh, 05279 had a lot more homework and a lot more uh, requirements for um, civil and site plan um, revisions that came through. So they came in relatively at the same time. The fence permit was the first one to be issued, and the site permit came in after and was approved after. It was appro- it didn't come in, but it was approved, approved after. Approved after. Right. It looks like uh, three months later, and then that was appealed when it was issued. You can't appeal something till it's issued. That's correct. Right. Okay. Keep going, Ms. Breckus. Thank you. So I'm, I'm confused because if, if staff is defending the issuance of the fence permit, why did it have to get married up to the site improvement permit? Was the fence it permit issued in air by staff because it should have been in uh, concert in tandem with the other permit? No, so the, the fence permit was issued because it conformed. Then it was determined that they wanted to put the fence on top of the retaining wall that was a, that was proposed with the site improvement building permit. Okay, so staff is, is of the position that 
the two will stand completely separate. Everything they want to do with the fence is fine, even if they don't build this retaining wall. That's helpful because we have two different permits pending. Now, this retaining wall, I'd like to ask a little bit more about that. Um, if, if this is a building and not a planning issue, isn't there a process to appeal building decisions through like a committee through the building code? Why are we at the, in this process? Our process at the city of Reno, we do not have a regional board of appeals. Any building permit, permit, permit appeal goes through the same process of a hearings officer um, like we would with anything else. Okay, I must be wrong because many years ago we did have for specific building, we had a building examiner we official. Did. We did, not for a long time, but uh, we do not have one currently. Here okay, okay. Now about the hearing officer's record of decision, and I see that's exhibit, what exhibit is that? Exhibit G, maybe? Yeah, G. Yeah. Is, is that the totality of her record? She didn't she just documented what happened, but she didn't state reasons why she was upholding and not finding abuse. I guess what's the standard is abuse and um, abuse and arbitrary or what, what's the standard? This is Jasmine Mehta for the record. The standard would be arbitrary and capricious or abuse of discretion. Does she state specific reasons why she did not find it arbitrary? She just. This tells us the story of, of time and place. The order itself. Usually, usually facts of binding are, are included in these records. The order itself did not include a recitation of, of the reasons behind her determinations. Her logic. Okay. Well, that's that, that was hard for me. And then the other thing is, um, well, I guess H, let, let me go back to exhibit H. That is the approved site plan for, um, it's 35 pages. What is that, which permit is that associated with? BLD 23-05279. So that's the site improvement, the grading? Correct. Where's the fence permit? The fence the permit. The associated with the fence. I do not believe that was included as an exhibit. It correlates to that that plan set and is include, shown on the plan set included in the overall site improvement permit. Council Member okay. Breckis, the fence permit is exhibit B. The fence permit is no. exhibit B. Exhibit the, B is the permit itself. It's the permit itself, but not the site plan. But not the drawings. Yeah, okay. I'm looking for the backup. You know, if the standard is that this permit was issued, you know, appropriately, you know, I, I don't need to see the permit. I need to see the backup. And I'm, I'm trying to understand. I see the backup for the grading, but I don't see the backup for the fence. And then Ms. Stewart mentioned these um, these large 10-foot poles that are right by his mailbox. I think they were showed. Those, you say, are going to be cut down at some point? They would have to be cut down to the corresponding height of the approved permit. So four feet within the front yard, six feet within the rear yard. Irregardless of what happens tonight? Correct. Then why aren't they cut down? If there's been code action of this property, why are they standing today to be of disturbance to Mr. Powell and others in the neighborhood? They have not begun construction on the permit because they've been tied up with these appeals. So assuming if this appeal did not go through and the permits were issued, they could start construction and make those improvements. Okay, so so you're, you're hold, withholding code enforcement activity? At this point, correct. Because okay. they do have a, they did apply for perm permits to legalize the condition. Hey, Ms. Breckus, I appreciate your line of questioning. Um, you are three minutes over, um, but this was all really good information. Let me um, let me do one final round of the team. Yeah, um, I have a few more questions, and I think for due process, we yep. need to make sure everyone has the time to ask their questions. And I, I agree. Sure the record is complete. Well, that Thank is you. why I've let you go. Okay, I'm just cutting it right now. Any okay. further question for Mr. Martinez? Uh, Ms. Taylor, no. Uh, for me, I was just going to ask a similar question about the posts. So the posts were installed prior to obtaining a permit, and rather than requiring them to take them out or cut them down to some height, you left them in place while this was pending. Right, in order to rectify the code enforcement action, they came in and applied for the permit. Gotcha. Which would have... But one of the confusions I have is when you say the fence four feet at the front, 
six feet at the back, but that's on top of the two foot rock wall. That right? is correct. So when we think about, but it's all really on the side of the property. So it's within, it's on Mr. Powell's side yard, side yard and front yard. It's on the front, it's really yeah, a side yard. It's on the it's south side, side of the property. Right, yeah. so what I'm wondering is as the property drops, um, is this gonna be like a level across fence or so, it will step down itself? Or? So the wall itself varies from two feet on the west side along Outlook to four feet as it moves east. So it, in order to, for, to meet that change in elevation. Yeah. So the wall itself is four feet at the back. At the back, correct. Okay, gotcha. All right, um, Ms. Hebert, anything? All right, back to you, Mr. Reese, anything? This is our no, final. Madam Vice Mayor. For I now, our final round. round. Okay. Yes, I understand. Thank yeah. you so much for keeping us on track. Yeah, just I want to be able to hear from Mr. Powell too. So um, Ms. Breckus, back to you. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. I, I have a question, Mr. Rayleigh. You, you kept talking about, and I guess the site plan for the um, grading permit um, shows it as a planter area, but Mr. Powell calls it a retaining wall. Um, what is the definition of a retaining wall? I don't see it as a Title 18 definition. Is it a building code definition? Hi, uh, Councilwoman Breckis, Chris Pingree again. The definition of a retaining wall is any wall or structure that retains a surcharge from either building or land. What's a surcharge? It, surcharge is any pressure put onto um, to a structure or wall. From like soil load. or? Correct, soil, what? foundation, could be anything. Okay. So, so a retaining wall is being constructed and was approved under that 375? No, 279. Under, five, under 05279. A retaining wall? Correct. Okay. And then a retaining wall can have a fence on top of it? It can, and the height of that fence is per code is measured from the top elevation of the retaining wall. Top elevation of the retaining wall. Now, why are you calling it a planting area? What's the difference? So it's, I, I think it's just kind of semantics, so to speak. So the, the retaining wall is creating the planter area. So there, there's fill being brought in and the retaining wall is, the fill being brought in for that planter area and then the wall is retaining that fill that's being brought in. And this, the fill that's being brought in, it's shown on that site plan, the grading plan, correct? That is correct. Okay. And how much is being moved and is it being imported or is it being excavated from elsewhere on the property? I do not have those exact quantities. Uh, like I say, it's two feet of fill on the, the west side, ranging to four feet of fill on the east. Okay. And Ms. Breckis, I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up. Um, and I'd like to hear from Mr. Powell. We can always bring the staff back uh, once we hear from Mr. Powell, okay? Does that work for you? Ms. Breckis? I, I suppose. Okay, great. Okay, we're, for those online, we're transitioning uh, to a, a presentation by Mr. Powell. And let me ask, is there any, just as our staff had a certain amount of time, is there any amount of time assigned? Okay. Well, if you could keep it within 10 minutes, Mr. Powell. I'll try. Okay. Um, okay, first about, it's, it's my wife and I that are appealing this. We've lived here since 2013. Uh, my wife's a retired public school teacher. Now she teaches at TMCC UNR part-time. I'm a... a I retired from active duty Air Force as a colonel. And uh, could you speak a little closer to the mic? Yes, That'd be great. Bad. It's been a while since I briefed anyone. It's no problem. Um, now I'm a consultant on an Air Force contract part-time. Um, I, I don't like to toot my own horn, but uh, I was advised to let you all know that uh, I have a, a, a degree in engineering, an MBA, and a master's in natural resource management. Um, I've done construction in non-paid uh, uh, modes, including a lot of Habitat for Humanity work, and I'm a backcountry backpacker, and I bring these things up because I know how to read uh, building plans, I know how to read a topo map, I know how to read contour maps, I know how to read this stuff. Um, and we, again, we were moved to Reno in 2013 um, after living around the world and around the country. We chose Reno, we had no roots here, we love this city, we like this neighborhood. I always got along with Tony and Carol until this. Um, so, just like, you probably know this, we're two and a half miles from where we sit right now, two and a half miles by street. This is Outlook Drive. 
It's in the newer part of the old south, southwest. The slope of that land is generally uh, south to north, downhill. Last Chance Ditch runs behind all the houses on the east side of Outlook Drive. The ditch actually flows uh, south. It flows south, it flows around. It's counterintuitive because the wash goes this way, the ditch flows the other way. Um, and the, the red is the property line in question. Uh, aerial view, I'm not gonna spend time on that. Again, here's the aerial view. Uh, this is the property line in question. Uh, my fence is here, the four foot wooden fence. It encloses about a third of my backyard. The property actually goes the, the property line for all these houses on the east side of Outlook is this fence right here. This line here, I guess I can do a, there we go. Right here, uh, last chance ditch curves like this. I'm having trouble with this mouse. It curves, well, okay. Um, it, it just curves around. Um, this is the, um, the site plan. Um, this one is the one for the wall and the fence. And I wanted to correct a couple of things on the timeline uh, that Mr. Uh, Rayleigh presented. These, this whole thing started uh, in July of 2022. So coming up on two years um, when uh, Tony, Mrs. Reno's son, put a 13, 10 foot tall fence post on the property line. And no kidding, some of them are taller than 10 feet um, from grade. Um, I talked to both Mrs. Reno and Tony, told them you can't put a 10 foot fence on the property line. I printed out what they could build. Tony basically told me I'm gonna build what I want. You can report me if you want to. I'm not one to report people for stuff. Um, I, they, they can do to their house what they want to, but this affects my wife and I. Um, they applied for a permit for the fence shortly after that. Uh, the grading, uh, He's, Tony started grading the back in October of 2022, so a year and a half ago. Um, myself and at least two other people reported him for that, not because we cared about the grading, but because he was doing it at night. Uh, Tony works uh, at night, so that's the schedule he's on, but nobody else's. Um, so uh, the, the, the project itself, th this is... Uh, let me get the cursor. So these are some uh, rock retaining walls. They vary in height from four to six feet. This is gonna be kind of a plateau out here. Um, this I wasn't, I, I'm worried about it a little bit, but my main concern is this part of the project, which is uh, this whole area, this whole enclosure which I have never called a retaining wall. That's one of my points of contention with the city is this is just a glorified planter bed. Um, but up here at the five foot curb easement, it's two feet above grade. And like Mr. Rayleigh and Mr. Pingree said, down here it's four feet above grade. Um, the, the natural contour of the land from this point on the street corner to this point, which is the edge of the city-owned sewer line easement. It's as far as they can build. It's a 10-foot drop in elevation on grade. The wall itself is two, uh, two feet above grade here. And down to here, it's four feet high. So it drops eight feet in total along its 155-foot length. Um, below grade is another two feet of concrete including uh, a pretty substantial footer. Um, and that's for the entire wall. It's a massive project. Uh, it will take at least 65 cubic yards of cement. That's 130 tons of concrete, 130 tons. 60 tons of that will be on the property line. This is a permanent immovable structure. Um, that's, I have a problem with that. The biggest problem I had from the start of this was the proposed, proposed fence was um, just to be that fabric cloth strung across uh, wooden poles. It looks terrible. Um, I've, I've seen what Tony built at Mrs. Reno's rental property in Midtown. Uh, it looks terrible. That's why I have opposed it from the start. 
So I see this project as violating at, four, at least four violations of uh, uh, Reno Municipal Code and the Public Works Design Manual. Uh, and I'm not gonna read those to you, we'll go through them. I did wanna, back to the site plan, uh, a question was asked, it's 450 cubic yards of fill that's gonna be moved around. That's per the grading plan submitted by uh, Robinson Engineering. Um, I also just wanted to correct, I have not stopped construction on this. I have always kept Ms. Reno informed about what I was appealing because I thought for a long time the city was keeping her informed. I found out they weren't, so I started giving her documents and stuff and let her know what was going on. Um, so I first wanted to address what the public works design manual is. Um, it, Reno Municipal Code, uh, the article on grading uh, specifies that the public works design manual applies uh, without limitation to grading projects. And the public works design manual says it applies to public and private improvements, including excavation and building permits. Um, so again, there's the overall site map. I'm gonna zoom in on the specific, specific areas of concern. At the uh, western side of the property line, so the, the street is here, the street is here. Um, the, the, these houses slope from south to north, the slope is from south to north. Each of these lines, contour lines here, is one foot difference in elevation. One foot difference. Water, and these arrows are indicating, uh, I'm approximating water flow there. Um, water flows downhill in the quickest means possible. It does not flow sideways across the slope. It flows perpendicular to the, to, to the uh, contour lines. So that's what I've approximated with these arrows. I can tell you from having lived in this house for uh, 10 and a half years now, uh, when we get heavy rains, water comes off my driveway and it cuts ruts as it travels underneath this fence over here. Um, the Reno's yard up here, they, they have a lot of plants and a lot of loose uh, you know, leaves and stuff from the trees and put a lot of mulch down, so it's absorbed. But I can tell you, water flows this way, there's no doubt about that. Um, there's, there's no way either putting a concrete wall is gonna disrupt that, it's gonna block the flow, and the water's gonna hit that wall and run down underneath all the fence posts and erode. It's, it's just gonna rip all the soil out of there. It's gonna ruin my fence, it's gonna ruin, you know, uh, and moving fill will do the same thing. That blocks the existing surface drainage. There's just no way around that. Um, the next issue was toward the west end of the project. And I've zoomed in here. The Public Works Design Manual states surface drainage from a developed, I wanted to back up, I forgot one thing on this one. Um, during the appeal hearing, um, the sit assistant city attorney uh, she kind of threw a red herring out there. She asked me if I have a, a drainage easement to let water from my property drain into an adjacent property. It's a red herring because my house was built in 1961. It met, it, it met Hold on just time. a minute, Mr. Powell. About how much more time do you think you need? I don't know. Have you been running a clock? Yeah. What, what do you start at? Three minutes? Ten minutes. Okay. Well, I, I need more time. Yeah. I can. You're talking to me. Oh. Mr. Powell. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm hearing it over here. Sorry. That's okay. I'm asking how much more time do you need? Uh, I was told I'd have 15. All right. Then take your next five minutes. I okay. apologize. Uh, I should have set it for 15. Okay. Uh, and I don't have a drainage easement. This is a non-conformity and non-conforming use. I do not need a drainage easement. Um, um, I'm not the one regrading my property after 60 or 70 years. Um, the next area is over here. Um, surface drainage from this project is being directed downslope across the property line. Uh, this is a designed drainage, uh, sorry, a designed flow path that's gonna sp spit the water out here. There's a, a, a pipe inside this wall, perforated pipe inside this wall. 
These are the low points on both of these wall sets. So those pipes are gonna discharge water here. This pipe's gonna be about a foot from the property line. Um, again, I drew these lines to indicate flow perpendicular to the contour lines. It's gonna hit right here and it's gonna cross my property before it gets, gets the ditch. Um, at the appeal hearing, and, and this, this, I put this in there to show what the natural contour was. This used to, the water used to just drain off, spread out across the back of the, Mrs. Reno's property. Uh, with this project, it's being concentrated into a small area. It's gonna cause erosion. Um, and I know they're hanging their hat on getting a PE to sign off on it, but a professional engineer from the city has not signed off on this. Um, so at the appeal hearing, uh, someone from the building department claimed that this is how the water was gonna flow. So th this is the design flow line, this line with the arrowheads. This is a, a very shallow drainage ditch. It's about four feet across and six inches deep. Um, it spits out right here at this point. This, the person from the building department said that this is where the water was gonna flow. It was gonna hit this point and, and break away from my property line. All this line is, is a pointer saying the elevation at this point is 4,644.72 feet. There is no structure hanging above the land as it drops toward the ditch. There is no swale designed in here, nor can there be, because this is a 10-foot easement in which no construction can take place. This is the sewer line, the city-owned sewer line. So nothing can be built in this area. So they're just spitting this water out and hoping for the best, which is gonna run across my property and cause erosion. Next item is uh, there is a requirement uh, that building plans have a signature from the dish company on the face of the plans. Uh, that hasn't been done. There's about 180 feet of last chance ditch that crosses Mrs. Reno's property. It crosses every house on the east side of Outlook Drive. It's nice having the ditch there, brings in wildlife. Um, this, at the appeal hearing, someone from Development Services stated that they have approval from Last Chance Ditch Company. Um, I did another, yet another public records request on and received the documents that I already had that are from March 2023. Uh, an email that says you can build your wall and an agreement between Last Chance Ditch Company and Mrs. Reno. Again, March 2023. Uh, at that time, this was the project, and I took down a section of my fence here to take this picture. These are the existing 10-foot fence posts, uh, and the project at that time was, um, Tony was gonna stack cinder blocks up here, fill them with concrete, shove dirt against the back of it, and call it a retaining wall. Um, and I have all the documents to show this. Um, here's the application status report from June, three months after they got that. Uh, the city is asking for the site plan. Where's the site plan? Where's the site plan? This is on the, this is on the fence wall permit. Same for the building permit. The plan shows only a small portion of the property line will have a retaining wall. This is three months after that March, uh, March letter from the ditch company. Um, this matters, Nor normally I wouldn't care about this. I don't care if the city gets in trouble with the ditch company. I don't care if Mrs. Reno gets in trouble with the ditch company. Um, but since this is gonna cause erosion on my property, uh, I don't want the ditch company coming to me and telling me I need to fix the problem because it's not my problem. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Powell, you're out of time. Could you spend one minute wrapping up, uh, summarizing? I mean, I'm, I'm willing to give you a minute more to summarize where you are what your main problems are. Those are the three. The, the last one is this issue with what I call the five foot rule for fill. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rayleigh just said- Madam Clerk, could you reset the clock please? Said that it was determined, so the, these two parts of the code prohibit fill 
to be placed within five feet of a residential property line for all land use types. Okay. And here are the paragraphs. 302, let me go to the actual text. Article three, section limits on grading says this paragraph in the residential adjacency section applies for all use types. Uh, so this is article four. Uh, article three points specifically to this paragraph, exclusively to this paragraph. It does not point to article 14. It does not point to the applicability paragraph of article 14. Uh, this in fact expands, expands the scope, oh, darn it. expands the scope and it prohibits fill for all use types. The city's position is that this, this paragraph in Reno Municipal, Reno Municipal Code is meaningless. It never does anything according to their interpretation. Mr. Raley said it was determined. That is the rub here. I, I contend they are not following code. Okay. They contend they are. I'm here All right. to get a decision on it. All right. And I'm done now. All right. So. Thank you so much, Mr. Powell, for coming and explaining your position and perspective. Let me ask, um, are there any questions for Mr. Powell? And again, I'll start with Mr. Martinez. Nothing at the moment. No. Thank you. Ms. Taylor. Okay. Ms. Ebert, do you have any questions for... Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. Yes. First of all, I observed, um, I happen to be a geologist, professional geologist, okay. but not a PE. Uh, but I did notice that it looks like historically the water from your property did flow across to your next door neighbor's property. You put up a fence. So that you showed us the flow lines. I didn't put the fence up. It's been there for nope. All right. Well, there's a fence on your property. Yes. So I imagine that backs up some of the water, but most of it just probably sinks in. Um, it, what I was concerned about was there was a comment made that they were finally going to be dealing with their drainage problem. And I don't know what their drainage problem is, but I'm going to ask later the engineer what the, or the engineer's rep what the drainage problem is. But I, what I observe from those contours you showed is that the water appears to be flowing from your property across to your neighbor's property historically. And, and no one objected. I mean, it's just a historical flow path. I get it. No one has uh, said, you need to stop that flow of water. It just is what it is. Um, am I right in saying that your main concern, uh, you've brought up a lot of points, but is your main concern about the style of the fence and the height of the fence? My, my main concern, and I have talked to Mrs. Reno about this since this all started, was I don't want a shade fabric fence okay. sticking up eight feet and then in the back, it'll be 10 feet, 10 feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. In the front, it'll be six feet front and side. That was my main concern okay. from the start. Then this project morphed into a, a 60 ton concrete right. wall on the property okay. line. And that's going to cause erosion problems for okay. me. Okay. And how tall above your fence is this fence? How tall is your fence? Uh, four feet. Yours is four feet. Okay. And I'm wondering, Madam Clerk, and I guess everyone, I, I would like to ask some questions to the people that are proposing the project. I'm not sure when I do that, but uh, okay. So uh, the, the, this, sorry, this is the 10 foot post he put up. Yeah. This is my fence. This is a six foot ladder. Okay. So oh, this is great. Perspective of the scale. I've oh. got some other photos in here. Okay, but this is great. So at this point, where you have the fence, the ladder. Uh, maybe I could ask our staff at that point, how tall is their fence supposed to be? Once again, for the record, Mike Raley, they would be permitted a six foot tall fence because that would be within the- On top rear, of the on four top foot. Of the four foot wall. So here, I think what his, he has a four foot fence and it looks like there's gonna be a four foot retaining wall backing up against that fence. Correct. And then on top of that four foot, so that would equal the height of this fence. And then on top of that fence will be another six foot. So, so what, what code would allow here is, is the four foot tall retaining wall with a six Which foot. Which would be the same height as his four right. foot fence. Is this, this is your rear yard. That's right. The retaining wall is two feet high. Oh, the, so, but, 
apparently, I, I don't have the plan, where the, this picture in perspective of where the plan is. Mr. Powell informed me the wall in this area is two feet tall. Oh, two feet. So you have two feet tall with a six foot fence on top of that wall. Okay, all right. And then um, just finally for me, so I have the, we get figured out these height issues. Um, something I'm really itching to ask the other folks is, what is the purpose of this fence? I mean, a fabric fence, I mean, we're, we're a windy area. You know, fabric, my experience, everywhere I've lived in Reno is that fabric tears eventually, especially when put perpendicular versus horizontal to the wind shear. You know, when you put up a, a fabric and the wind is coming here, it's ultimately going to impact your, your fabric. I mean, it's not really built to withstand wind. So do you feel this, this is a design that's going to last? I, I would defer that back to the applicant. Um, yeah. Like I said, we do not regulate materials other than Right, I understand. Razor. It's my understanding that I don't know if they have a maintenance plan where they would replace the fabric periodically. I would have to refer okay. that back to the applicant. Well, I'm going to eventually like to ask them that. But let me go to online. Uh, let me ask first, and I haven't heard from the mayor. Do you have any questions at this time, Madam Mayor? Okay, hearing none, moving on to oh. Mr. Oh, you do? I don't. No. Okay, moving on to Mr. Reese. Madam Vice Mayor, I don't think I have questions at this time. Okay. And then Ms. Breckus? Yeah, I do. Um, Mr. Powell, could you go through one of your exhibits? You know, as, as Mr. Raley said, we don't have in our record the building, the fence, the backup that was submitted with the fence application. We have the backup that was submitted with the grade plan, grading plan but we, permit, but we don't have that. And you showed something on there. Um, let me see, one of your exhibits, it was a, it came out of the record. I think it's, are, are no, you, the other I, way, the other way. It's, I, well, it's, I've got some it's, backup. I've got the entire plans in here, uh, I yeah, think, or most of but them. But it was for the fence, it was for the fence. There was some notations. Was it for one of the grading or one of the site plans? Yeah, yeah, it was one of the site plans for the fence. Because we don't have the fence one. And then what were the notations down here down at the bottom on basically on your property? What did the, what did those notations say? Is some, it a slide I presented previously? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, a slide you presented when you were going over. Yeah, maybe that maybe that one right there with your notations on it. Was it this one? Maybe. maybe. Okay. Okay. Construction. Uh, okay. So this is from, th these are the site plans that Robeson Engineering drew up. Um, so this is said 70 linear feet of concrete wall. Okay. With four foot tall fence. Uh, at this point, it trend, this is, this is at the corner of the house is the uh, delineation between uh, front yard and side yard slash backyard. Yeah. So from this point, from the, and by the way, my house is, I can actually see uh, the front of their house from the backyard of my house, just the way the houses are on the property. So from the curb, five foot curb easement to this point, total height of six feet from this point to about to here, it's uh, eight feet and then as the ground drops away it grows to 10 feet it's about 10 feet for the last 25 feet of wall and the question about uh miss Dewar, the uh durability of this fabric this fence is going to get ripped to shreds this is un completely unsheltered uh land there's no trees there's no houses same with street the street uh, wind comes ripping down the street and down rosewood wash and this stuff is just not going to last it's, it's gonna get shredded. Okay, so Ms. Breckus was your- Yeah, yeah, okay. the, notes, the notes on there were what caught my eye and it said something like retaining wall not a part of this, oh, right. it's C grading permit. Right, yes. right up here. Okay. Yeah, it's in a couple places. So, so, the per, so you're in with the, you're in appealing a fence. And you're explaining this fence should have never been permitted and we have a pretty good idea what it is because someone started building it without um, getting a permit and they're way out of compliance, 10 feet tall. And then all of a sudden, this approved grading plan comes in. 
And now you're appealing not one, but two items. And I, I guess that's maybe why it continued on because they, you know, midstream added this other permit. Is you, your view that the two should go together, that the fence should have never been approved and could absolutely not have been approved in the absence of this grading permit? Yeah. And the grading, is that just yes or no? Uh, y yes, I, I I got confused about your question. My my view is the grading has to be done in order for this to be a retaining wall. So the grading permit should have been issued first because yeah. there is nothing to retain without grading. They yeah. issued this, the, this, you know, six, eight weeks before the grading permit. Yeah. So, so you're with a fence and if the grading permit was never in existence, you know, we, we could see visibly 10 foot tall um, beams. And if, if, if the great if it just came in without the grading, we just see a fence consistent with the fence that you have, right? That four foot one, correct? Well, I mean, they, they could build from this point forward four feet, from this point uh, back six feet, and uh, originally, uh, I think at one point Tony put in uh, a plan for six feet the entire length, which got uh, approved by or approved on accident. Uh, approved erroneously by someone at the development services. Um, and I, but frankly, if he would have been building a standard wooden fence, and I've told Miss Reno this, I wouldn't have objected to it because it wouldn't be ugly. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, so, so basically they can go four feet until they get to the end of the house, because that's side yard, and then they go six feet because they're on a corner, and then they can be a back fence six feet. But basically they manufactured this retaining permit to justify being able to do 10 feet because then it raises up the ground and then they can go four feet above the retaining foot. Is that is that the purpose of the retaining or do you see? Well, you're, um, you're, you're correct in that the uh, is way, you know, I can't speak for Tony, but from what I saw the way this progressed, it looked to me like he decided to build this retaining wall to get two extra feet in height uh, uh, out of his fence uh, down here at the back where the land drops drops off pretty steeply, he's getting an extra four feet. Um, but again, the total height will be six feet to the corner of their house, then eight feet, and then where the land drops off, it'll be 10 feet. Yeah, so so you start with a fence that's very clearly, um, you know, not, not in compliance, and then it gets married up mid appeal with a permit that's basically a, a workout. Um, so that's that's two permits. So we've got two permits ahead of us, and um, Ms. Breckis, and I, um, okay. me, I know and you're. What was your take? If I could, well, there's no fat findings of fact from the hearing officer. Correct. What what was her? What's your interpretation of why she issued it? Are you asking our attorneys? Yeah, Mr. Powell. Oh, I don't know that Mr. Powell can speak to that. I mean, what our attorney, what the hearing officer was thinking. I mean, are well, you no asking our attorneys? Officer was thinking. Are, are you asking our attorneys? You asked about findings of fact from the hearing yeah, officer. Yeah, I'm asking Mr. Powell because she just tells us what happened. Why do you think she approved it? My my impression, having gone through this process, I'd never done one of these before, was that the uh, the initial hearing appeal hearings are frankly just a roadblock before I get to see counsel. I think the, the decision was preordained. Mm -hmm. She asked very few questions and she took at face value everything that development services and the building department told them, even when they said things that were not true, okay. like that the ditch company had signed the plans. That was never true. To my knowledge, it's not true to this day, but she did not follow up on that. She just believed them. Mm -hmm. I had a ton of evidence. She just discounted it all. Okay. okay. Uh, Ms. Breckis, we're, you're almost five minutes over. I'm going to, we're going to do one final round with Mr. Powell. So I'm going to Mr. Martinez. Any questions at this point? Ms. Taylor. Okay, Ms. Ebert. All right, I have a question for the Reno family, yeah. if uh, they would be willing to come up. Madam Vice Mayor, Mayor Sheevy does have her hand raised as well. I'm sorry. Um, well, let me just get my question, then we'll go to online, if you wouldn't mind coming up. It sounds like, uh, and what is your name? Y yes, my name's Tony Reno. Tony Reno, and you're part of the Reno family? Yes. Okay. Um, it, it sounds like 
um, first of all, I just want to say I've been on council 10 years. Um, I've heard many appeals, including appeals about fences. And um, I can't recall ever seeing a 10-foot fence, I'll just be honest. <laughs> Um, even in commercial applications, we had a big appeal about a six-foot fence in a commercial application. Um, I don't recall all the details on that one, but I'm just sharing that um, with the, um, the retaining wall, four foot in the back, and the fence at six foot, you're at 10 foot, which is your poles, oh, right? Cor uh, correct. It, uh, the fence will be six feet, correct. Right, yeah, on top of the total height. Yeah, yes. So what I'm just struggling with is the need for such a permit. Uh, I, I know that we are supposed to look at facts and did the code be followed, but I can't help myself. I wanna ask you, why is it so important to have such a tall fence? Could oh, you share? Um, well, I mean, it, I mean the, the, it's, um, as, like, as homeowners and people in the community, we have a right to, to build a fence that's six sure. feet. Um, as far as, um, the more details on it, I can go into. I don't. I don't want to take up everybody's time. Sure. So, um, it's just uh, uh, there's been um, issues with light coming from the other th from the neighbor's property. Oh, light. Okay. And um, it, I mean that's been just kind of an issue. Um, we, there's 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 um, they have a raised deck and there's light been flashing in the in the there's rooms on that side. They leave the lights on at night and okay. that's been an issue. Um, and um, regarding the the. Uh, just to, regarding the, the fabric, it's designed to have airflow through it, ah. and it has a, it has a UV per, uh, uh, protectant um, that's supposed to last several years. Okay, and it would be replaced. We don't mind putting in wood as well. It's just for pri It's for privacy. Okay, it's it's it's, it's, it's a called a privacy. Um, privacy. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And it sounds like blocking light. Yes. From the next door neighbor. Yes. Okay. And I was we, just trying we, to understand. We, yes. I hadn't run into the situation yes, before. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And yeah, it's, um, but it's designed for yeah, pri yeah. privacy. In your conversations, and I mean, we are sitting in a quasi-judicial role here in appeal, and so I'm just going to ask this kind of question. In your communications, it sounds like Mr. Powell's raised a lot of objections, but did you guys ever talk about why it needed to be so tall or what your concerns were about the well, light or anything? Well, it's just, I mean, like, yeah. I just go back to privacy. We yeah. had stuff um, pulled from out from a mulch from the fence, um, pulled from and put around, you know, other stuff. And we've okay. had um, issues where he said, she said, I don't want to get into that, those issues. Sure. Um, it's more for just privacy gotcha. and just, yeah. That's, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to online now. Um, Mayor Shivi, you had your hand raised. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, listening to his presentation, I'm, to me it sounds like this is more of a design issue. Is, is that correct? I know there's some runoff issues, but it sounds more like this is a design issue. I think it's, I what I've deduced hearing this is it's about the height of the fence and the material being used at the fence, neither. Uh, it sounds like the height is within our re regulations and we don't regulate material, is what I've heard from our staff. Yeah, and um, I don't know if we're getting all the slides on online. It, it seems like it goes in and out with the camera, but is there a um, design from the, uh, I guess, who's building it? It's, um, what's the company name? What is the name of the company, sir? Yeah. It's going to be Evergreen Excavation. What is it called? Could you come up again? I'm sorry. Evergreen Excavation. Evergreen Excavation. Yes. And oh, okay. they're excavating and building the fence? Yes. Okay. And do you have um, what the final design and Is there a picture like? or drawing of what it's going to look like? Um, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't have it on me, but yes, I mean the, the fabric has was it was it's, it's in the plans. It has all the, the details, the flow. The, like I said, it's designed to have airflow through it. It's in a in a very natural color, um, and it's very even. Um, you know, uh, so it's it's designed to look to look to look good. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, keep going. Okay. Um, and then Mike Rayleigh, will you please talk about our design standard and code? Uh, what's a, applicable to code when it comes to design. And just to confirm, because I believe that Vice Mayor just pointed it out, that this still is in regulation of height. It's conforming height regulation, correct? 
Correct. Once again, for the record, Mike Raley. So unlike a lot of neighborhoods that might be encumbered with CCNRs or design standards through a PUD handbook that regulate fencing or, you know, currently it's not uncommon for tentative maps to have a fencing plan on them these days, that those conditions don't apply to this parcel. These, these homes were developed back in the 50s and 60s and so they're not subject to those standards. So it defaults to Reno Municipal Code. So Municipal Code does not regulate fencing materials other than barbed wire, razor wire, security type fencing. So mm -hmm. the materials proposed are within our code allowances, so to speak, to construct the fence out of fabric. We don't regulate color, we don't regulate, what we regulate is the height of the fence, where that can be within the, the setbacks and that sort of thing and how we measure the fence it's very specific in code that it's measured from the top of the retaining wall. Okay, I got you. And so just to confirm for the record, this height conforms with our code, correct? Correct. Okay, um, I think that is important. And then um, just like we see, I think it's functional obsolescence where sometimes we can see in older neighborhoods where someone might have built a McMansion um, or have... Uh, you know, a very modern structure um, in an older neighborhood. And so what you're saying is because of those older standards, you, you would be allowed to design basically anything you would want um, according to our code. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. I just want to get that on the record. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, oh. Mr. Reese, um, anything for this round? No, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't have questions for the okay. applicant, Mr. Reno. All right, uh, Ms. Breckis, did you have further sure. questions? I have questions for our staff. Okay, that's fine. Let's call our staff up. Okay, they're up. Okay, uh, Mr. Riley, I am looking for a, um, a I guess a, a a cross, not a cross section, but a um, a rendering, if you will, of the retaining wall. Because I've noticed there's a quite a bit of grading that's that and um, soil disturbance on this property, particularly from the Belford sign. It looks like there's just piles of rocks that look to me like you know cairns, and um, you know, Mister. Um, Mr. Powell saying that's not a retaining wall. And so, um, you know, it's just gonna be a bunch of rocks piled up. Well, I see a bunch of rocks piled up on one part of the property. And so when I look into building um, uh, exhibit um, H, was there, a cro was there a profile of this retaining wall? And, um, and is there a, um, a public works manual um, uh, model of what, you know, pr um, rendering of what the retaining wall looks like? Chris Pingree, Director of Development Services. Just for the record, the fence and the two-foot retaining wall that starts on the east side or the west side working to the west side, that was all submitted with the fence permit application. The rest of the site in grading, which is that east side of the property with the rockery walls, that is where the geotech report, that is where the Robeson Engineering came in to, uh, to, we had requested multiple revisions to make sure that was built per standard, per, per the structural engineer's uh, requirements and our normal retaining wall application. So that is a rockery wall on the, on the east side of that that was built per plan, part of that site and grading permit. Well, does a rockery wall allow the same allowance to count as um, height to go four feet atop of the rockery wall? Because I thought it, you could only go four feet atop the retaining wall. The fencing on the south side of the property is not on a rockery wall. That is a concrete retaining wall on that side that runs from the west side of the property to the east side on the south facing side. The rockery wall the is on the back side on that east on the east side where it shows clearly in the site plan the rockery uh, outline. And where is the fence in relationship to that? Is it on the toe side or is it on the other side? So where the cursor is there, where the red line is, that is a that is a concrete two foot starting retaining wall with the fence on top of it. 
and the fence on top. And how tall is the fence above the two feet? It, it's it, in the plants. It's four foot tall in the front, six foot tall uh, um, from the corner of the house. Four foot heading. Here. Okay, so so you could be six feet. You're you're allowing the rockery wall to count as added fence height. No, that is not correct. They're going to raise the elevation of the Reno property, the 2600 Outlook, to match that retaining wall height. And our code clearly states that the fence is measured from the top of the, of the retaining wall to the top of the of the fence being built. Okay, so so do you do you have a profile of that? Is that retaining wall? Is it interlocking bray block? Is it um, you know solid, put it solid, base rocks? solid concrete retaining wall is what was shown on the plans. Okay, solid retaining wall just perpendicular to the earth two feet and then on top of that is six feet four feet in the front six feet in the back okay so a total of eight feet now if, if nothing was done if we just stayed with natural grade what would be allowed six feet right now correct okay so the exercise of bringing all the concrete putting it on the top Engineering it gives them an eight feet. And, you know, that's what Mr. Reno said. He wants privacy on this property. So in a way, he's doing a lot of engineering to get that. But Mr. Powell, I guess the struggle for the council, when you look at those, you know, the flow down to that east property is, is he shooting the water out on their side? Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Um let me see if there's a final round. Just a minute, Mr. Powell. Um, well, did you need to amend something that was said? This is a question you asked, Ms. Dor uh, you asked Tony, uh, who's doing the work. Evergreen Excavation is an LLC that Tony set up in his name. He is doing the work himself. Oh, okay. All right. Just to be clear, there are no professionals doing this work. Okay. All right, um, I'm doing one final round for my everyone. Ms. Taylor, anything? Ms. Ebert, anything? Okay, um, I just have, I guess, two final questions. Um, um, I wanna follow up on this point Ms. Breckus was bringing up about the retaining wall in the front. So is there a, require, is there a need for a retaining wall in the front? I mean, they've, think, they've said there is, but from your professional opinion, is that needed? I mean, yes. a retaining wall has a purpose. Correct. Verse different than a planter bed. Correct. I have a planter bed, which has a wall right. like two feet high. So if, if you look at the fill that's being brought in, so you can see this line here. This is yep. essentially the planter bed. So that wall is supporting all that It's fill. the back of the planter bed. Correct. So okay. it is retaining that soil. So gotcha. Okay, okay, very good. And then for you, Mr. Reno, one more time, if you wouldn't mind coming up one more time. I'm, I'm just going to, you do not have to say yes. You can say no, but I'm just going to ask because we're here. We spent all this time with you. Is is there any willingness on your part or interest in lowering any part of this fence? Let's say the front, uh, for, instead of being four. Uh, sorry. Four. Let me make sure I say it. two foot uh, wall with a four foot fence, six foot in the front. Is there any interest on your part or willingness to work with your neighbor on that? I mean, it's not a legal question. Right. We've discussed this and it's, we've gone back and forth. It's it's just, like I said, we've had some issues with um, stuff being taken, some, some mulch and then um, okay. just some, it's just been, it just seems that it would be better just to, to do the route stick that, with that we, that, yeah, stick okay. with it. Well, I'm going to ask you, I don't know what the answer is going to be here at council, but it is something to keep thinking about. Thank you. You know, in the interest of good neighborhoods, we're all about that. Um, here at the council and in our neighborhood advisory boards, we want neighbors to get along and to, to um, lean in, I guess is the word, to work with each other. You're still going to have a fence, I'm confident, of some height, and you're still going to have a retaining wall. Um, and it may be exactly as you've proposed based on, you know, we're going to lean on um, council member Breckus, it's her ward, to make a proposal, uh, proposed motion. But I'm still asking you to think in the back of your mind if in the interests of neighborly uh, activity, you know, that's something you want to think about going forward because you're going to be building the fence. Correct. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. And thank you for considering uh, the uh, other avenues. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, we've gone through um, this, this process a couple times and okay. um, we've tried to do it in the most um, neighborly way. Okay. And um, there, ha there hasn't any, been any foul language coming from our end. So, yeah. yeah.
Okay, Thank very you. good. All right, um, back up to you, Madam Mayor, and then we'll go to Mr. Reese and then Ms. Bruckus for final. Nothing for me, Madam Vice Mayor. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Breckis, any final comments or thoughts? Yeah, I have one last question for staff. This um, provision that, um, you know, he, there's a reference re that Mr. Powell brings up related to the grading. And it, it references, it's, it's very interesting, it, it references the residential adjacency standards about the five feet fill up from the um fill coming in from the five feet i think it's 1804302 um well maybe it's not it i think it's what what, what section is that 180 yeah 1804 1404 correct that's correct which is which is a, essentially a subsection within the residential adjacency standards but his point is another code section that is applicable is just coming over here from what what section of code is he mentioning making saying that's coming from he's he's pulling out of the the actual grading section of the code about fill slopes and when it talks there when it refers to section so residentially zoned property when it refers back to that code let me it, it refers back to this section of the code so 1804, 1401, which if you see is the residential adjacency standards. And if you look at 1804, 1402, this article applies to all non-residential development built on or within 150 feet of any residential property. This is residential property. So therefore it is not applicable to this property. When it, when it says all use types, it's referring to all non-residential use gotcha. types. Well, you know, I'm not sure about that because he's got a reference from another point that says, well, you know, here we go. We just want a reference over here to grading, you know, and so I don't, I, what is the section that he's referencing it from? I can bring him up if I need. I've got the code up in front of me. I just want to. So he's pulling that out of the general grading standards, 1804302. Which fill. apply everywhere, okay. Correct. You know, apply everywhere, right? Right. And then how does it reference, where does it reference that 1404? That's under item or subsection two, where it says fill slopes, and then fill slopes adjacent to regularly zoned property shall comply with the standards in section 1804, 1404. So by referring it's, back it's, to 1804-1404, it's referring, it's, it's that, reference is to non-residential development so we well, do see but you know what i don't i don't think that's right i think that when i read this fill slopes adjacent to residentially zoned property okay so it doesn't matter if you're industrial next to residential or residential against residential the code says go over to the grading section now let's go over to the grading section and what does the grading section say let's go let's go over to that that can you bring up that other section yeah i'm bear with yeah, right here. Right there, sorry, it's not my presentation. I didn't know the order. Yeah, right here. For, okay, so he says, you know, adjacent to residential. It does, that section, which is general, wants you get to get into this grading section because this is how we're dealing with grading. And I, I, I'm, I find it compelling, to be honest with you. Okay. So um, if, if I made that. That, so the section that you see there, 1804-1404 grading, is part of the residential adjacency standards no, I, article. I understand that. I understand that. But it's being referred to from something outside of this. It is. And that, to me, is a reading, you know, I, I think that's a fair reading he's offering, knowing how protective of grading of one property you know, of grading, how sensitive activity grading is. So I, in my motion, I'm going to uphold that that is a fair reading okay. and that there was an error in that, you okay. know. Well, Ms. Breckis, well, I think yeah. your main point, I think, is this section talks about a five-foot setback versus uh, four-foot. Is that correct? No, I think what it is is it says within five feet of a side yard, you can't you can't grade the the five foot setback. Cannot grade the five foot setback within okay? five feet. Yeah, yeah, can't do it. Can't do it. 
I just wanted to make sure if we understand your interpretation and what that would mean. So let's just say you're right, but what it would mean is that they couldn't have the fence within the five foot. Is that what no, you're saying? No, they can put a fence within the five foot. Just they no just can't fill. put a fence at the top of a rockery wall or a retaining wall. Okay, can't use the and fill. No, and, and to me, you know, that the reason, another reason why that makes sense is you know, that five foot is a pretty standard um, access route around a property, yeah. too, you know? So so you're um, saying, though, that yeah. they could have the the rockery wall or the retaining wall five foot from the fence line and have a fence on top of it, right? Yeah, they got to be off the property line. line. Okay, I just they wanted to make sure what your conclusion, if, if you're correct or you believe you're correct, what how that would flow into this. So I just want to understand. So Ms. Breckus, I think we're at the conclusion. We've asked all our questions. I'm looking to you for a motion. Okay, I'm gonna make a motion and I do offer findings of fact, because I think that's what you know, we, got, we sure as heck better do in every decision. Okay. I believe the hearing office, finding fact number one, the hearing officer was arbitrary and capricious in holding up these two building permits without issuing findings of fact, okay? Two, the hearing officer was in air in allowing midstream an appeal of one building permit to be co-joined by a subsequent issue issuance and appeal of a second building permit, the site approval one. She should have ruled on the existing appeal as a standalone matter. Okay, that's number two. Three. The residential adjacency standard in 18.04.404 sub A1 related to fill within five feet of a property line is applicable in this instance. Therefore, the permit is in error in allowing fill within the property line, within five feet of the property line. Four, the designated flow path of the site improvement permit at the east end is a violation of um, public works manual paragraph 202.2.2.2 in sending water across Mr. the, the uh, neighbor's property, the appellant's property. For these four reasons, um, these four findings of fact, I recommend that the appeal is upheld. And if I may, I, we need a second, and then we can discuss what your motion is. Is, is there a second here? A second. Okay. There's a second. Uh, a second I, for discussion. Yeah, for discussion. Uh, did you have something, um, Madam Mayor? Yes, I do. Um, I would love to hear from Jasmine uh, Maida, I believe that's our attorney that's in the room to talk about property rights, um, the law under that, and what your interpretation is of uh, the findings here, and anyone else, uh, Mr. Pingree, um, how you see this similar or different. So the mayor's asking you to opine on, um, I suppose, these findings affect? Um, well, with respect to the property right question, as Mr. Raley said, a lot of these subdivisions have additional CCNRs that would um, have prevented uh, this kind of fence in this case because of the, the um, longevity of this neighborhood. They don't have those in place. And so the um, planning staff basically, this is not a discretionary permit. They look to see whether the rules have been adhered to, and if they are, um, then they have to issue the permit. Mm -hmm. um, and you're willing to defend that our um, staff meets every criteria? I, I <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I just wanted on the record. I appreciate you. And uh, sorry, I didn't see Carl in there. Hi, Carl. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, Madam Mayor, did you have more? No, that's, okay. that's what I want to know. Okay. If our legal 
um, if our legal believes that yeah. our staff followed okay. all the protocol and uh, code. Great. Thank you. I have a question too. Um, Ms. Meta, you said that it's an older neighborhood. I live in an older neighborhood that was built around the same time as this neighborhood, but we do have CCNRs. We don't have HOA, but we do have CCNRs. And, and do we, have we determined if this neighborhood has CCNRs? Um, I believe that determination, I believe that they were, Mr. Rayleigh might be able to okay. jump in, but I believe that they were um, searched for and not found. That, for the record, Mike Rayleigh, that's correct. We have found no evidence of any CCNRs recorded against the property. Okay. Okay. And a question, I think, for Ms. Breckus, if um, your motion were to pass and the appeal was denied, um, let me say the appeal was upheld, which is what your motion is. Um, what would be, I guess I'm asking our staff, what would be the outcome of that? Would the applicant be able to reapply, uh, but with a fence and retaining wall outside the five foot setback? If we follow Ms. Breckus's logic and that's Mike, approved. Mike, really for the record, yeah, I, I would assume that yes, I would probably defer to Jasmine, but I don't oh. see why they could not come back and reapply with for a fence that met our code standards and whatever recommendation. But the only difference I'm hearing is that we, they would still have the rock wall issue, uh, retaining wall, they could still build the fence the same height. It would just have a five foot setback if Ms. Breckus's reading is correct. That's correct. Okay. All right. Is there, are there any more comments, questions from anyone on this motion? The motion, if you could, uh, you have stated uh, that you objected and did not confirm, uh, you you objected to lack of findings of fact in the administrative hearing officer's order, and then you listed out all of the issues. The one I didn't follow very well was your number four, which said that we found that there was an impact on flow. Could you say that one again? Yeah, that the designated flow path at the property's east end is in violation of Public Works Design Manual paragraph 202.2.2.2 in that it will direct water across the appellant's property. Okay, because we've had no, to your point, findings of fact that said that would happen. Okay, other uh, than a statement that it would happen, but. Okay. Well, I've heard a balance of testimony. Okay. I've heard a balance of testimony from staff who issued the permit. I've heard a balance of testimony from the materials submitted by Mr. Powell and finding number four um, finds agreement with him and references the applicable okay. citation. All right. Um, I'm going to call for the uh, motion. I mean, the question now we have a motion from Ms. Breckus, second from uh, Ms. Ebert. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Nay. All right. Uh, the nays have it, so the motion does not pass. Is there what an? Was the, um, I'm sorry. What? What? what who? What was the roll call? Okay, vote Madam the Clerk, could you do a roll call, please? I went on the voice vote. Councilmember Breckis. A. I. Door. Nay. Martinez. No. Ebert. Uh, yes. Taylor. Nay. Reese. Nay. Sheevy. Nay. Motion fails two to, s five. Two to five. Okay. Is there an alternate motion um, either from you, Ms. Breckus? Your motions failed. Would you like to venture another motion? No, I will not. Okay. Uh, was anyone from the body wish to make a motion on this case? Madam Vice Mayor, I yeah, have Ms. to. Mad um, Council Member Taylor. Um, thank you. I move to affirm the denial of the appeal by the hearing officer based on the rules of code and were adhered to by our planning team and the hearing officer. Okay. Is there a second on that motion? I'll second. And who was that? I'm sorry. Mayor Sheevy. Thank you. All right. So we have a motion from Council Member Taylor, uh, second from Mayor Sheevy. All in favor, please say. Uh, can we have discussion? Oh, yes, absolutely. Please go ahead, Ms. Breckus. I was just looking for some findings of fact. Did you not get the staff report? I'm confused oh, so on what you're asking. The, 
So it's all in the staff report. Yeah, everything that I need to make my decision was in the staff report, and it was based on what I heard from both sides and our legal team and our code team or our planning team. Okay, if that's the level of specificity for the uphold, I, I appreciate that on the record. I'm, I'm ready for the vote. Okay. Um, are there any other comments or questions about the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Nay. Opposed. Okay. Uh, motion passes. Okay, so the um, appeal is denied. Um, I think that you do have further appeal rights through the court system um, if, if you want to pursue that. You also have an opportunity to continue talking to your neighbor and uh, to see if you can work something out. I'm just offering, you probably, it sounds like probably not, but you know, never say never, right? Um, all right, well, I think that concludes our hearing. Do we have to take any final public comment, Madam Clerk? I have closing public comment, if that's yeah, what you're referring to. that's yes. what I'm referring to. All right, um, is there any closing public comment? I do not have any public comment registered. However, for the record, we did receive one letter um, after 4 p.m. yesterday, one letter of concern. It has been distributed to the Reno City Council and is a part of the record. And with that, we have no additional public comment. We're on item K adjournment. Okay. Um, and I know I did not voice a vote, um, so I, I was... I was also in, um, I did not support the motion, just so you know. I wanted something in between. I thought Ms. Breckis's motion went too far. I thought just pure approval was not where I was. So I did not support either motion. I just wanted to be clear about that because I wasn't clear. So um, with that, you said there's no final public comment. Sorry, and just can we motion to reconsider item G2? G2, yes. Okay, it's been brought to my attention that item G2 was, um, was there was a misstatement in the staff report, and I don't know if we can just rehear it or it has to come back, but apparently the staff report said that there were three appointments in historic resources, and so I made three appointments, but there were only two apparently, they discovered later, um, and so they would like me to only make two. Let me ask our attorneys, do we need to bring this back or is this a... No, it's been properly noticed today, so I think you can clarify the okay. issue to right now. Okay. Can we have a, a motion to reconsider item G2? Second. Okay, I made the motion. Second from Mr. Reese. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, back to item G2. I would like to recommend uh, Ms. Deborah Campbell and Mr. Greg Ernie, um, as the two individuals I'm going to appoint at this time. To this. Second. Okay. Second from Mr. Reese. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All, um, any opposed? All right. Motion passes unanimously. And just so you know, we, we have appointments coming up in the future, and we'll have an opportunity to consider the other folks on this list uh, in a few months. All right. Um, is there any more business in front of our team here today? Ms. There is not. Just a motion to adjourn. All right. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. Mr. Reese. Second. Okay. I think I actually heard a second from Ms. Ebert. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passed unanimously. Thank you so much.